Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the Board of Health. Uh, good morning. We're going to get started in a, morning, in a minute. Good morning. All right. Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, welcome to the meeting 10 of the Board of Health, to members of the board, uh, to members of public, and to those who are following online. You can follow the agenda and debate on your computer, your tablet, or your smartphone at www.toronto.ca slash council. The Board of Health acknowledges the land we are meeting on as the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to also acknowledge that the longtime chair of the Board of Health and a near and dear friend, somebody I affectionately refer to as Papa Joe, is in the audience today. Joe, could you just stand up so we could recognize you here? Oh, there you go. I agree with that. Uh, and we all love our near and dear Papa Joe, of course. Uh, may I begin by seeing if there are any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Okay, seeing none. Uh, can I have a motion to confirm the minutes of September the 23rd, 2019? Moved by Director Wong. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. Um, we're going to now walk through. You've had communications already uh, sent around for those who are looking for communications from outside. Let's walk through the agenda. Uh, item 10.1, Toronto Food Policy Council 2019 Annual Report. We're going to hold that for a presentation and speakers. Item HL 10.2, Food System Transformation and Toronto Food Strategy 2019 Update. Again, we're going to hold that for a presentation and speakers. Item HL 10.3, Food in Toronto, Affordability, Accessibility and uh, Insecurity. Uh, there are no speakers or a presentation on that. Would anybody like to hold that? Okay. Seeing none. Um, Okay, Councillor Wong Tam would like to hold that. Item HL 10.4, Strengthening Heat Resilience in Toronto. That will be held for a presentation and for speakers. Item HL 10.5, Noise Action Plan. Uh, that is being held for a speaker. Um, item HL 10.6, Proposed 2020 Schedule of Board of Health Meetings. Uh, Moved by Director Layton. All those in favor, opposed if any, carried. Okay, so we're good. we have two new business items as well, uh, if, which we need to move to add to the agenda. The first uh, is a letter from me for an update on Toronto Public Health reorganization at our December meeting. Uh, would anybody like to move to add that to the agenda? Moved by Director Perks. All those in favor? Opposed, if any, carried. The second, we have a new business item for, from Director Wong Tam for updates to the hookah bylaw. Uh, would anybody like to move to add that item to the agenda? Council, or Director Wong Tam, all those in favor, opposed, if any, carried. Those items for members of the board are on the pink sheets and they have now been placed on the agenda. Okay, so let's dive right in. It's Monday morning, it's first thing. There's never a better time for a meeting. Um, the first item, uh, HL 10.1, Toronto Food Policy Council 2019 Annual Report. We're going to start with a presentation, then we're going to move to uh, members of the public who have registered to speak, uh, and then we'll bring it back in to committee for questions. Uh, so Dr. Navilla, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, from you turning it over to me, I believe I'm actually turning it over to Rachel Gray, who is the citizen co-chair of the Toronto Food Policy Council. If we can call up that presentation. I will hand it over to you, Rachel, and thank you very much for being here today. I will endeavor this morning on behalf of 
both the TFPC, my, the organization I represent also, which is the Stop Community Food Center. Uh, in front of you, you have a full report um, which outlines the many activities of the TFPC over the last year. Uh, what I want to do today, however, and what several of my colleagues from around the city and from the Toronto Food Policy Council will be doing, will be emphasizing why the food system is a public health issue at this time and a city issue and must be fully supported by the Board of Health and, of course, by City Council as well. Hmm. There we go. Thank you. Earlier this month, City Council voted unanimously to declare a climate emergency, joining more than 800 cities around the world acknowledging the scale of uh, the climate crisis and the impact it's likely to have on every aspect of life in the city. Oh, Sorry, the transition from one's own to, can you just, perhaps that would be great, thank you. Also earlier this month, Mayor Tory signed C40 Good Food Cities Declaration, committing the city to align food procurement policies with the goals of a healthy, sustainable and low carbon diet, and to significantly reduce food loss and waste. It also commits Toronto to working with businesses and organizations of all kinds to make the shift to a low carbon food system and to reduce food loss and waste. Thank you. These commitments follow the August release of a report from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which found that the food system is responsible for more than one third of all greenhouse gas emissions. Meanwhile, food security is still a major problem in the City of Toronto, and we continue to hold the dubious title of Child Poverty Capital of Canada. You can go ahead. Uh, one in four children live in uh, families below the poverty line. Racialized children are twice as likely as non-racialized children to live in poverty. And 84% of Indigenous children live in poverty in Toronto. We know that poverty and food security go hand in hand. Food security means, frankly, that health cannot flourish. And if that's the case, of course, hope and potential is lost. Whether it's the climate emergency or the growing rates of poverty and food insecurity, food is a major public health issue. In this era, when the food system is ever more implicated in public health, the City of Toronto has two powerful tools already that it must protect, the Toronto Food Policy Council and the Toronto Food Strategy Team. The TFPC was established 30 years ago and is about actually to celebrate its anniversary. It is the world's oldest food policy council in a major city, the second in the world and the most highly regarded globally. It is a forum for resident engagement and a way for the Board of Health to tap into the incredible citizen resident knowledge and expertise in this city on food system issues. The uh, Toronto Food Strategy was adopted by the Board of Health in 2010 after extensive community consultation. It was the world's first comprehensive food strategy in a major city and we are looking forward to celebrating its 10 years in 2020. It built on the efforts of the TFPC to establish food system work as a priority issue for the people of Toronto and all divisions of the city. The F Toronto uh, Food Policy Council is the reference group for the Toronto Food Strategy. The TFPC and the Toronto Food Strategy team helped to ensure that health policy, social policy, environmental policy and economic policy are integrated by bringing a food system lens to all city issues. Growing a sustainable and just food system is central to growing sustainable and just Toronto. And to be clear, uh, in order for this return on investment to take place, it needs to be understood uh, and it needs to be fully both recognized, uh, the impact throughout all of the divisions that uh, the TFPC and food strategy are able to provide input to. Uh, we are delighted at the TFPC to hear that the uh, Toronto Food Policy Council will continue to receive permanent, knowledgeable and skilled staff su uh, su support, uh, in particular during an era of, uh, of such uncertainty. Uh, we must also assume that there will be confirmation of a permanent Toronto Food Strategy team if Toronto is declaring a climate emergency and signing the C40 Food Declaration are actually going to be meaningful in any way for Toronto. <laughs> For over 30 years, the TFPC has provided critical leadership on these issues at the city, ensuring that Toronto is seen as a global food leader. We want to call on the Board of Health, on the Medical Officer of Health, to ensure that the TFPC continues to be nimble and effective, providing strategic input across the city divisions from within TPH. 
and that the TFPC and food policy work continue to be recognized and exist within an appropriate reporting structure, reflecting the dynamic nature of the food system. Really, to be clear, this input cannot be minimized. We cannot shortchange ourselves or the investment that we're going to make. We cannot fund city staff positions and then relegate this work to a sidebar conversation. If food, the food lens is in fact going to be applied throughout the city, and if we are going to achieve the kinds of impacts that we need to, both on the climate side and, of course, on the economic side, given that the food industry accounts for 10% of the economy and jobs in this city, then the TFPC and the food strategy need to remain both fully staffed, supported, and recognized as such in a reporting structure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, so as that's a presentation right off the top from Rachel Graves, the co-chair of the council, um, why don't we begin with questions of Rachel? Because uh, we don't, and, and forgive me off the top, it's not a staff presentation. So why don't we start with questions of Rachel and then we'll move into the deputations. Uh, questions for Rachel. So on, on my end, Rachel, um, as it relates to 30 years on with the TFPC, um, Specifically on the climate side around environmental sustainability, where do, we, where do we need to go over the next 30 years as we continue to look at food policy as a way of mitigating and confronting climate change? So if we look 30 years from now, where do you see that? I would suggest it's really not over 30 years. I, I think it's over 10 years. I think that we're all very clear about the fact we just had the first federal election of what presumably would be three in the 12 year mark that the UN has provided us for. I think where food comes into this kind of work has to do obviously the 30% greenhouse gases, the food system itself needs to change and we're clear about that. But anchor institutions like the City of Toronto have huge influence and power. So when we're talking about anything from fruit procurement to food waste, the city can be uh, a model for uh, other institutions in the city and beyond uh, as it already has been. On the, on the food file. And I think that looking at more aggressive targets, certainly uh, when it comes to food procurement, so we're talking about local food, we're talking about a reduction of those GHGs because we're talking about food that comes from Ontario and not from California or elsewhere. Uh, and, and looking at food loss uh, and food waste as well and understanding that, that, again, there are practices that the city can put in place that will then be modeled for other organizations, large institutions uh, in the downtown core and throughout. And in a number of those pieces, and I know item HL 10.2, when we talk about food systems transformation, we're going to delve into. I know Councillor Layton has some specific thoughts on that in particular. As it relates to Toronto Public Health, so we've had 30 years of the Toronto Food Policy Council, oldest in the world of a major city like ours. Um, if I understood you correctly, the two key areas um, that you want to make sure that we embed going forward. One is a full staffing complement to support it, and the other, can you, you just expand on what you mean by where within the organization food should sit? Sure. I, I think um, the graphic behind you is a good indication of just how complex uh, the food policy work that the City of Toronto has been doing, and recognize that it has been going uh, for 30 years at this, uh, at this pace. We, we need to understand that that complexity will be minimized if we have uh, Toronto food policy staff, be it at the TFPC side or the food strategy side, if they are relegated, for example, to um, perhaps d uh, disease prevention. Uh, this would be, it would be difficult to imagine how someone who is supervising a food file, uh, whose background is in disease prevention, for example, would be able to speak to the climate implications of a food policy or the economic implications of a food policy, or the social implications of food policy that see newcomer strategies being developed around how food can, uh, food can bring communities together. We, we really do understand food to be a very complex file, and uh, it would seem a rather, uh, a rather unfortunate uh, structure, and I would suggest uh, a poor return on the investment if we have those staff reporting not at a city level. It, this is a citywide uh, policy. These are citywide initiatives that need to be recognized as such, uh, and the reporting structure needs to recognize that more, more so than it has been done in the past, so that we can achieve the climate objectives that we have just uh, committed to, so that we can see uh, the economic development that we need to have happen in the city. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Rachel? 
Uh, Director Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you, Rachel, for your presentation. With respect to your comments about um, the citywide policy, I, I just want to sort of parse that out a little bit. Um, how do we measure that people are going to be in a better position to tomorrow than they were today? Because we've got growing in uh, poverty, we've got growing f uh, food security. Um, so we have a policy that's telling us that we need to do better, get healthy food into people. But how are we measuring that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I necessarily can tell you exactly how we're measuring that at the Toronto Food Policy Council because we're an advisory board. Uh, I would say that Toronto Public Health has a number of different ways that it would measure that, um, it, but it's not. it would not only be through Toronto Public Health. I think that the um, poverty reduction uh, strategy, for example, would measure the number of children who go without food and who live in households uh, that are considered low income. Um, those are the kinds of indicators that the city is looking at, and the TFPC and other food uh, food policy will inform any number of larger citywide functions. For example, um, within the last few months, uh, the staff from Transform TO attended uh, and brought their work forward to the TFPC and our membership. And I believe there were, possibly because of the agenda that day, uh, upwards of 50 people in the room who were able to provide uh, feedback to Transform TO, and will be following up in the coming weeks as in addition. Uh, how we build the city uh, to be healthier, how we create those long-standing goals, is to gather together the evidence that comes from community and that comes from academic uh, and other expert bodies and, and apply the food lens accordingly so that we can look at uh, you know, objectives like whether or not children are in fact through a student nutrition program eating uh, and you know, sort of gaining access to the culturally appropriate food that they need every day. Uh, whether we have, I would say, um, uh, local food that is in fact being purchased by large institutions in the city so that we know that those ripple effects are happening. Not only are we actually gaining local food, uh, supporting local farmers, but we're also reducing the, the GHGs that are happening as well. The TFPC itself is an advisory body, and so we are less focused on the indicators per se than bringing the information to the table both for the Board of Health and for the Council. Then as an advisory body, are you satisfied with all that the City of Toronto is doing, including all the different divisions that could be much more proactive in responding to the issue of food uh, insecurity, such as uh, city planning? Uh, we are zoning and building new buildings, uh, city infrastructure that perhaps there could be uh, rooftop gardens and, and food production uh, in the buildings that perhaps we have missed opportunities, uh, parks that are being acquired, built, that are, that are done so without uh, food producing uh, gardens. Uh, are we doing as much as we could given the opportunities before us? No. And, and there, there, to, to be clear, there is a world of opportunity and every single time the Toronto Food Policy Council hosts a meeting that talks about, for example, urban agriculture, we are flooded with Torontonians who come in and say, I've got a small business idea, I want to grow food uh, and be able to sell it. Uh, we can look at the example of the seed gardens, which is a protracted process uh, that the City of Toronto tried to engage in around ensuring that people in a variety of communities across the city had access to hydro quarter lands where they could both grow food and sell food. Uh, we, have, we have consistently faced obstacles, which I think we are able to overcome. I think we need to look aggressively and persistently at issues regarding uh, the, uh, the zoning of rooftop gardens, um, allowing there to be more uh, park space that is devoted to community gardens where people can grow food, not because that in and of itself will address food security, but as an activity, it is a community builder, it diminishes social isolation, and it in addition allows people to grow the food that's appropriate for them. Um, I would also say that when we consider, uh, from a planning perspective, the amenities that need to be uh, relevant for people in communities, as we see the level of densification uh, continue across the city, and I speak as someone who works in the neighbourhood of Davenport, which is expected to have something in the neighbourhood immediately around the stop, close to 20,000 people move in in the coming years. The flip side of that is that our food bank has had more people uh, sign up and come, uh, come forward in the last few months than we have since, I believe, 2013. So as the city continues to support densification, as we continue to see our neighbourhoods change and new households develop, this is all wonderful, except, as long, except if, if we ensure that there are amenities, there are appropriate kinds of businesses, businesses that are supported um, and other amenities are allowed uh, to flourish in those same communities. 
So would you say that, would, my final question is, would you say that it would be helpful that although the City of Toronto has adopted this citywide policy, uh, it could be argued that the different divisions have not necessarily embraced the food lens over their, their work and, and implementation execution. So therefore, if we had a, a motion or amendment here that directed all the divisions to actually uh, uh, review the food policy uh, and then to, to adopt it, uh, with, uh, with the purpose of implementation operation in the work that they do, uh, would that be helpful in achieving the, the citywide objectives? I think it certainly would. We, we've had the experience recently with the Toronto Agricultural Program, uh, which was a citywide uh, initiative uh, and which uh, was an effort at looking at urban agriculture from across city divisions. And uh, my own personal experience as a member of that committee was watching members of city divisions attend the meeting with a, a, a clear look of confusion about why it was that they were in the room. And it took some time for them to understand that <clears throat> when we talk about uh, food waste or when we talk about community gardens, that if you are with TCRA or if you're with Parks and Rec or if you're with Economic Development, you actually have a way into this file and a responsibility for this file. Right. So I most certainly would say that uh, in particular, given the importance of the food lens when we're talking about climate change, um, in addition to all of the other files, I think most certainly it would be helpful if we were able to adopt that kind of a food lens uh, requirement for city staff. It would then, I think, assist them to understand the complexity of food. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Director Lane. Yes, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for your work on the council and your professional work in the city. I, I live not far from the stop, the main hub, and it's remarkable uh, what you do both for the communities in need as well as bringing together people around food, which I think part of this transformative system change that needs to happen. There was a time when Toronto was the leader in I think many aspects mm -hmm. of, of the, the Food Policy Council. And while the model for the Food Policy Council may still be the best practice, the Toronto model, um, a lot of cities around the world are doing some fantastic, some fantastic uh, things. Is there any one or two things that you think cities around the world are doing that Toronto has missed the boat or the bus on? Uh, I might I might ask if I might report back to the to the uh, to the board later on that so that I answer it correctly. You know, we, we have talked about or I have mentioned procurement and I think you'll hear from others today who mentioned that as well. <clears throat> I think that that is one of those um, uh, you know, sort of multifaceted issues that it really does touch on both the economy and the environment in addition to uh, to healthy food and, and as a consequence our health uh, benefits. That certainly would be one of the one of the pieces. I think we want to continue to look at food waste as a really serious issue, but we want to very clearly disentangle that from a, a notion of um, a poverty reduction or a food insecurity um, uh, initiative or response. Because food waste is over here, and the fact that people don't have enough to eat is over here, and we want to not not combine those two. Um, I think that you uh, see many, many other jurisdictions that have uh, an approach to urban agriculture that is much more dynamic than we've been able to keep up with here in the city. And that means not only that there is food grown in uh, a multiplicity of places, but also that it is allowed to come to market differently. And uh, and that also would have a great impact. But if I may, I'll, I'll consult with others on the council and perhaps get back to you if I may. Thank you. Um, what, what's been the staff compliment from TPH with respect to the council and, and do you think that that's been adequate in actually achieving transformative system change that, that we need to see? So I, I, will, I will say off the top that my uh, position here is as a great believer and supporter of, of Toronto Public Health and of public health in general. Um, I think it's critical for the city. And so I acknowledge uh, most heartily that the Medical Officer of Health and her team is um, navigating a quagmire of difficult choices. That said, uh, as the chair, co-chair of the TFPC, uh, most certainly we have felt um, the press of, uh, of the current um, the current economic landscape, um, we have uh, one, we have had one uh, one position that was approximately 50 percent of a policy specialist, a food policy specialist, and additionally some administrative support. <clears throat> I think 30 years ago, certainly in the last sort of number of decades, there have been there has been more staff allocated, um, and the food strategy team, additionally, of course, works hand in hand with the the, the TFPC team. 
Um, my suggestion would be that if we are going to make good on Councillor Wong Tem's um, adoption of a food lens for city divisions, that this should rest on, on the shoulders of more than 1.5 FTE, along with a minimal amount of administrative support. That it would be very challenging for me to imagine how anyone would be able to communicate that to a variety of divisions, all of whom have their own priorities um, as well. But again, I would take it back to a climate emergency, the city's commitment, council's commitment, um, if, if, we, if we really genuinely think that Toronto, as a, the largest city in the country, can have the kind of impact it, ha it wants to have, even just on a climate level, with only a 50% uh, food policy specialist, I, I, would be, I would be amazed. Well, we've got 30-something percent of our GHGs and something as fundamental as food, and we've got 1.5 FDEs trying to handle a sy like systemic transformative change. In, in that policy area. That's that's a pretty big task. I would I it agree. It seems like we just kind of unloaded it on TPH to say, like, here you go, because no one wanted, no, no, no one really wanted to tackle such a immense issue. The conflation of timing, the, it, you know, TFPC and foods sat within Toronto Public Health. We are now trying to address other you know, sort of emerging clear priorities around around climate transformation, climate chaos. I think that the fact that uh, the city has made this change in its agenda at a global level and wants to make that commitment as a city would behoove us to then make ensure that there, in fact, are uh, adequate supports for this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Rachel? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, we're now going to move to public deputations. Our first speaker is Sunday Harrison from the Green Thumbs Growing Kids in Toronto Food Policy Council. Welcome. Thank you. So how it's going to work for members of the public, because you're our first, is you'll each have five minutes. There is a clock just up to my right, your left, so you can keep track, and then we'll have a chance to ask questions. Great. Thank you so much. You I bet. appreciate the opportunity. Um, again, my name is Sunday Harrison. I'm the founder and executive director of Green Thumbs Growing Kids. We work in Ward 13 and partner with the city and the school board. Um, when I started Green Thumbs, it was just a dream about how to engage children in the wonders of gardening, and including producing their own snacks, composting, and nature exploration. It was 1999. I lived near Riverdale Farm and the City of Toronto graciously agreed to host my first after-school program. While I was researching the content and similar programs, I came across the Toronto Food Policy Council. And the fact that it was a creation of the Board of Health made so much sense to me. Um, after all, it was children's health that was my prime motivator for starting a program. I figured if they grew it, they would eat it which is what the research says. And parenting my own picky children gave me lots of insight into the lure of fast packaged foods and the need as a parent to promote fruits and vegetables in their own packages on the vine coming from the garden. Fast forward 20 years and Green Thumbs is deeply engaged with three elementary TDSB school gardens and partnered with the City of Toronto at Riverdale Farm, Allen Gardens, and Regent Park. Um, we now create program opportunities for over 4,500 children every year, plus a, another few hundred youth, parents, seniors, teachers, and other adults. And we need all the networking we can squeeze in. It's an adventure each year to keep our school garden producing healthy food and healthy kids an adventure I only dreamt about back in 99 when I contacted Sean Cosgrove, then the staff member at TFPC, who graciously allowed me time in the office to research any data I could find on children's gardening as a means of health promotion. Since then, staff members Wayne Roberts, Lauren Baker, Jessica Reeve, Laurie Stahlbrand have all been active supporters of Green Thumb's goals and have demonstrably facilitated deep engagement with food as a powerful community development tool. Along with their community co-chairs, such as Rachel Gray, 
and your previous community co-chair, Alain Saint-Jacques, who has graciously agreed to serve on our board of directors, in fact, chairing our board for the last two years. I'm very, very pleased to hear that TFPC's staffing will be continued. Running an organization that relies heavily on volunteer labor, I know that some things are just not possible without paid staff. It's really about accountability. And I believe that in our climate emergency, food is more important than ever to unpack, as we just discussed. An otherwise healthy city will collapse quickly after three days of none incoming. But of course you know this, and you know that we can't wait to plan. We must start now. School gardens may not save us from climate change, but they are part of the resilience strategies we need. Strategies that address health through education, through hands-on experience, through the knowledge that the lands and waters are our only source of life. We are in danger of separation from their life-giving powers when we rely too heavily on technology and not enough on practical food skills. The Toronto Food Policy Council has inspired similar councils around the world and our very own Toronto Youth Food Policy Council, a recognition that youth perspectives and engagement are truly the future of food. At Green Thumbs, we are blessed with a dozen or so practicum students each semester and we get to bounce our ideas off them to test for relevance and appeal. And they help us run our programs that require a high adult-child ratio. We hope to fill in gaps for them that maybe the education system missed. How to preserve a harvest. How and what, when to plant what. We are a fractal of an organization that is always learning and always teaching. The treaty lands we are using are teaching us what is good to grow here, how to manage squirrels and other small mammals, and still compost our food waste, teach about food systems, and how to be climate change ready in the garden. Toronto land is very arable. It needs to be cared for to produce food. The Toronto Food Policy Council understands food as much more than a commodity. It is a relationship between humans and the land. It is definitely a matter for health policy. And as a parent volunteer turned founder and executive director of a small food literacy charity, I rely on our Toronto Food Policy Council community for the support we need to operate. And thank Senator, you for hearing my gratitude to the Board of Health for maintaining this critical piece of infrastructure. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions for Sunday? Uh, Director Wong Tam. Yes, hi, Sen Sunday. Thank you very much for your presentation. With respect to the uh, the programs that you are operating uh, directly out of uh, the, the the Green Thumbs Growing Kids program, um, the 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 partnerships with TDSB as well as the the other community stakeholders, um, would it be how, how would you would you do you have the capacity to scale that up to, and to export it beyond the Ward 13? Thank you for the question. It's something we've been working on. Um, I think uh, my model it, it, uh, is scalable, but not without more uh, institutional supports. Um, yeah, and what, what type of institutional supports well, addition do you need? I, I, think, I think the school board um, could provide us with an educator if we weren't in a period of austerity in that regard. And that would reduce our um, fundraising needs considerably and allow us to expand. So that would be my first um, idea for scaling up, is that because this is education related, that the education system take a piece. Um, I would also suggest that the city take a piece of summer programming because school gardens fail because of summer. And Yet we have children march through, you know, bright sunshine through the, in the summer camps who could be going to their the school grounds and participating in healthy activities with the, just a little bit of leadership. So Parks, Forestry and Recreation could assign staff for summer camps in those school gardens and that would brilliantly expand their capacity. So with, with, with those institutional supports, yes, we could scale up. 
Um, and I think that we've, you know, examined this from a policy perspective and compared it to other jurisdictions and we can see that it can be scaled up. There's an organization very similar to mine, started by a parent volunteer, same year in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts called City Sprouts. And she's, uh, she's in, I think, 50 schools. Um, and that's because the schools pay a portion, the board pays a portion, and she fundraises for the rest. So it's, we're just in a period of austerity that's very difficult to ask for that public support. So we're carrying on without it, but we cannot really scale up without it, I think is the, is the short answer. And in the, in the past, I mean, we have precedent certainly between the city and the, and the school boards collaborating together, whether it's learn to swim programs, community hub type of spaces, after school programs. Um, so there is a precedent of working together. Um, yes. And if the, the school board and the city decide to work together on this to uh, extend the education into the summer to make sure those uh, food gardens don't fail when the kids are out of school, um, that would uh, continue the continuity. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely, because the summer is the, is the pain point for school gardens. So if the city was able to step in and make uh, uh, institutional support available to schools that want gardens for the September to June period, it would, it would enable those gardens to be much more successful. And, and so what I'm hearing from you is that perhaps just a, a modest amount of money, or is it staffing that is required? Well, I, I mean, if, if, if summer staff that are already hired by the city were simply trained and deployed in school gardens, it wouldn't even be an extra expenditure necessarily besides the training. So it's, it, it's almost just a, a, a low-hanging fruit. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, are there any other questions? Yes, Director Donaldson. Thanks, what, what schools are you in, in the TDS? Uh, Rose Avenue, uh, Winchester, and Spruce Court, and Nelson Mandela Park off and on. Okay, great. Um, this has been a great discussion, some good ideas. I look forward to connecting with you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Correct. Thank you, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Sunday. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Debbie Field. Everybody knows Debbie. Debbie, welcome. I was presumptuous that everybody knows you. No, <laughs> lots of people. Um, hi, my name is Debbie Field, uh, and I'm here actually uh, as a resident of Ward 4 uh, <laughs> to ensure that my counselor, Gord Perks, knows how important I believe uh, the Toronto Food Policy Council is. Um, we're in the process of visiting all of our city councillors. Uh, there's hundreds of us, actually. Our, our uh, Friends of uh, Toronto Food Policy Council Facebook page has, I think, 2,800 people on it. Um, and we're in the process of reaching out to all of our city councillors to let them know very personal stories uh, about what the Toronto Food Policy Council has meant in our lives. I'm also here because I work uh, as the coordinator of the National Coalition for Healthy School Food, uh, which is in the process of helping to negotiate uh, Canada's first uh, federal commitment to school food, uh, which has, the Toronto Food Policy Council, I'm gonna talk about that in a second, has had a lot to do with. And I'm also uh, a visiting practitioner at Ryerson uh, University, the Center for Studies in Food Security, and we've just, begun a research project called 30 Years of the Toronto Food Policy Council, where we're actually going to try to chronicle uh, all of these examples. Uh, it, I think uh, that's where I want to start, uh, about policy into action, because when you hear something uh, called the Toronto Food Policy Council, it may seem uh, pretty abstract, uh, but it actually is very concrete. It is actually literally uh, about how people eat uh, and how they will eat better. Uh, and how children eat at school, and as you heard from Sunday, the amazing process that we've had uh, with gardens. And I think the way to think about the Toronto Food Policy Council, if I were you as the Board of Health and uh, you as the Medical Officer of Health, uh, you as Public Health, you as the City, you as the Mayor, is to think of a package that allows other things to grow. Um, so whether it is uh, literally the, the school food program, uh, which I made a deputation in this room as a parent in 1991. Uh, and I, uh, there's so many great documents. So here's a document from 92, June 29th, 1992, uh, implementing a provincial community-based nutrition program by the Coalition for Student Nutrition. And uh, though it's signed by Fiona Knight, uh, who was then a staff member uh, at Food Share, 
where I worked for 25 years. It was actually written by uh, Dr. Rod McRae when he was at the Toronto Food Policy Council. So the costing of the National School Food Program happened because there was a Toronto Food Policy Council. A few years later, when I was at Food Chair, we uh, had this great idea of a field-to-table traveling food truck. And uh, Mary Lou Morgan and Ursula Lipsky designed it. And uh, there, I wrote to the city uh, and said, do you have a warehouse with a refrigerator dock and a and uh, a loading dock and refrigerator capacity, and they wrote back, said, yes, there is such a building, but you'll never be able to use it. It's part of a territory. Uh, and the Toronto Food Policy Council then uh, was able to negotiate with the city that uh, the Good Food Box and the Field to Table Centre, the food, first hub uh, in this city uh, of its kind, uh, and the first Good Food Box program in the, in the world, uh, was a project uh, of the City of Toronto, and the Toronto Food Policy Council um, was able to negotiate those kinds of things. Years later, of course, we have amazing work through TEDCO, uh, the Toronto Economic Development Corporation with the incubation kitchens, uh, and the food strategy 10 years ago, which has embedded uh, even deeper understanding of many of these issues in food policy. So um, I think one of the ways to look at it is as infrastructure. And one of the great things about living in Toronto is we talk a lot uh, about the waterworks. And my favorite one, even more than the waterworks, would actually be the building of the subway, or the building of the bridge across the Don before there's a subway. So you build capacity uh, infrastructure. And um, I think you know here uh, at the Board of Health, and you hopefully know, uh, the Medical Officer Health knows, but. Could you try to convince your colleagues, the rest of your colleagues, that actually the Toronto Food Policy Council is infrastructure at that level? And one of the things that's very, uh, very sad in infrastructure spending is if you start a project and then you have to get rid of it. So yeah, as you'll hear from us today and a lot over the next few months, please do not make any cuts to any of the current funding of either the Toronto Food Policy Council or the food strategy. We need, in fact, expansion of these functions. Um, as we move into what is uh, a growing a global understanding uh, of the climate crisis facing us, uh, we need to think about a market in every ward in the same way that we've talked about uh, a garden in every ward. Uh, we need to think about, uh, you heard Sunday say it, many of us will say it, in New York there was exactly three days worth of food during 9-11. Uh, Mustafa Koch at Ryerson uh, did a study similar to that and there's only three days worth of food in, in Toronto. How will we eat with any kind of global crisis? Thank you very much. Uh, questions for Debbie? Seeing none. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, our next speaker is Paul Sautel from 100 Kilometer Foods. Paul, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Paul Sautel. I'm one of the entrepreneurs and business owners behind 100 Kilometer Foods, an award-winning local food distributor based right here in Toronto. In our work with 100 Kilometer Foods, we are rebuilding the middle infrastructure in our broken food system, providing dedicated sales, marketing and distribution services to small and medium-sized farms in Ontario that have great challenges accessing local markets dominated by our industrial and globalized food supply system. In doing so, we have created the network and logistics necessary to allow over 100 Ontario producers to gain access to a wholesale market they otherwise would not have easy access to. We have created over 25 full-time jobs and another five part-time jobs in Ward 5, York Southwestern of Toronto. And this year alone, we will sell over $9 million of local food from Ontario farmers and producers to Toronto and GTA restaurants and food businesses, further multiplying our economic impact. 100 Kilometer Foods started within Food Share's business incubation program which was linked directly to the work of the Toronto Food Policy Council through a field-to-table project created by Mary Lou Morgan and Ursula Lipsky and a grant from the TFPC. Without the business incubation support of FoodShare and the TFPC grant, 100 Kilometer Foods would not exist. Twelve years later, we are now one of the largest local food hubs in North America and the largest in Canada. Through my work with 100 Kilometer Foods, I've been very fortunate to have met and worked with Laurie Stahlbrand, the outgoing TFPC lead, on a number of projects throughout the years. Laurie invited me to participate in the TFPC to bring my perspective as a small business owner in the local sustainable food space to the discussion of food policy issues in the City of Toronto. 
Over the past 18 months or so, I've worked alongside a very diverse group of citizen experts with an extraordinary wealth of expertise and experience in food systems, food justice, and food policy work. Having leadership by a full-time city staff member has allowed the TFPC to remain efficient, focused, and able to produce results. As we continue to face the consequences of the climate crisis in the years to come, the impact on food and food-related issues is inevitable. As a resident of the city, I feel it is vital to have a fully funded TFPC city staff member to continue to convene and lead a diverse and experienced group of advisors, advocates, activists, and practitioners to help Toronto navigate the future challenges we will face around food, food access, and a just and sustainable food system. As a business owner, I understand you get what you pay for, and our resilience relies on a stable and permanent TFPC leadership. Please accept this deputation as my full support for continued and ongoing funding of a full-time and permanent City of Toronto TFPC lead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Are there any questions for Paul? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Rhonda um, Title Payne from Toronto Urban Growers. Welcome, Rhonda. Good morning. And congratulations on getting my name correct. I was wondering, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, yes, my name is Rhonda Tidal Payne, and I'm here representing uh, Toronto Urban Growers, which is a citywide network of people growing food in the city. And I really um, appreciate, and I'd like to say thank you to the chair and board of health members for giving me the opportunity to right now share my, my gratitude um, for the vital support that um, the Toronto Food Policy Council and the food strategy have given to people who uh, want to grow food in Toronto. Um, I'm a past member of the Toronto Food Policy Council, and I continue to stay involved with the TFPC as a coordinator of TUG. Um, mainly because, and we've heard this already today, but mainly because uh, TFPC has a, a fairly rare understanding that growing food in the city not only increases access to, to food, uh, but also achieves other city priorities. Uh, Rachel spoke very clearly about uh, fighting climate change and um, also reducing poverty. Sunday was talking about um, youth engagement. I would also say, you know, uh, the Food Policy Council understands urban agriculture's role in building stronger, more resilient neighborhoods. Um, a more equitable city is, uh, is a very high priority. Um, and leveraging people power through actually involving residents in pro uh, programs. Uh, without this understanding, city staff may not seek connections to their work, and urban agriculture falls to the bottom of a pile of competing priorities. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about other divisions that, that, that need a little help uh, understanding where food falls into their, their work. So, so thank you, Councillor Wong Tam, for suggesting that we, we have this motion. I, I think that's very important. Um, but okay, so urban agriculture falls to the bottom of a bunch of very pressing priorities. Well, so what? What, is it, what does that mean? Um, we've had to, to fight a perception that urban agriculture is very much a leisure activity. It's fun, um, creates pretty gardens, but it's really not essential. And I think one of the, the things that the Food Policy Council has really helped us uh, argue is that, okay, 100% of our, our city's food needs are not going to be met by growing food in the city. We know that. However, there are a range of other uh, services that, that growing food in the city will, will provide. Um, obviously, people will be eating more fresh produce. Uh, there's a lot of research to show that when people grow their own food, their consumption goes up. Um, but more importantly, it gives people the power to grow food that is really culturally and personally important to them. Um, and the only way I can really help you understand that part is to tell you about um, a group of Tibetan gardeners that I work with in, in Parkdale. Um, and uh, I proposed a project to them, a pilot project, where they would be able to generate a little bit of uh, extra revenue from the food that they grow in the garden. I thought, wonderful idea. Well, they didn't agree with me. The food that they grew in their garden was so much more important to them than the money they could have earned selling it because it represented their culture, because it was organic, because they grew it themselves and they, they had trust in it. Um, so that was a, a big lesson to me. Uh, I would also say from, from the people that I've 
heard from in Indigenous communities that growing food, getting back to the land, um, and growing their traditional medicines uh, is not something that's just fun to do. It's a survival strategy. It's an important tool for them to heal as individuals and as nations. Uh, and, you know, if you ask any garden coordinator, they will tell you the same thing, that sure people like growing their own food, but sometimes they're doing it for more important reasons than that. Uh, they're rebuilding their, their physical and mental health. It gets them out of the, the, the four walls of their limited spaces, gets them into green space, and builds social capital. You know, that when you're handing the zucchinis around to your neighbors and so on, that, that kind of thing. Um, they have an opportunity to learn and demonstrate skills that go far beyond food growing, uh, skills that can help them gain employment um, or to work to improve their community. And uh, this is when it comes back to, to climate change because you know, climate change is one of these issues that's, that's really overwhelming for people. Uh, gardens and getting involved in growing food gives people a stepping stone to thinking about taking broader steps. And I think I want to take my last few seconds to tell you about another gardener. Um, if you go to the Toronto Food Policy Council meetings, you'll see him there, Shaw uh, Mohudin. And uh, when I first met Shaw, he talked about his long gourds. Now, when he's organizing community garden events, he makes it all about compost waste reduction and, and climate change. He's making those connections. So that's where I would like to thank the Toronto Food Policy Council because Council helps to make those connections. Um, so keep up the good work. We know how difficult it is right now. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, question to Rhonda, direct Director Line. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for, for your coming here. So your organization help people or teach them how to grow? How, is that how, what the intent is? Uh, we don't do so much of the direct teaching. Our members do that. What we try to do is uh, help uh, gardeners connect with each other so they, that they can learn from each other. So they share information on how to grow stuff and all that. Do they grow in the garden at, at the backyard or sometimes maybe Everywhere. community gardens? Everywhere. Community gardens, backyards, balconies, rooftops. So businesses. balconies, they're using pots, I, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Um, but you know, the other thing that we try to help people do, the learning, is around um, some of the policies that, that sometimes um, obstruct these, these new ideas. People are coming up with new ways to, to garden all the time, whether it be spaces to grow, methods for growing, but also the way they organize their work. So we're seeing more social purpose enterprises. The number of businesses that, that are actually very community focused is really heartwarming to me. That's, that's my background. Uh, so, but the challenge to that is, is, and we heard this earlier too, that when um, there are policies put in place that don't reflect this, this new, innovative kind of growing, that stops people, it puts a stop to it. I see. How many community gardens do you have in your area? Do you, do you, do you have some of those in your area? Uh, well, I, I, yes and, I can tell you yes and no. Uh, we have a number for community gardens and organizations and businesses. It's very challenging to get an accurate number because there's new stuff coming up all the time. But we have, um, this is my second brain, uh, we have 371 uh, community gardens. So that's community and school gardens. And um, we schools. also have uh, 48 organizations that, that are working in urban agriculture and 33 businesses. Wow, because I growing all the time. I've been vis visiting my community gardens, and we only have one in my ward, so I think I have a lot to actually catch up. And I really nice to it's nice to actually learn how the, the downtown is the urban. I don't know whether Scarborough is being coming becoming urban, and you know, but I think uh, it is a very very good cause and a very very good uh, you know uh, way to to help people. To, to, you know, to grow their own food. In fact, my, my husband and I, I think we grow in the pots and we eat our own vegetables, mix salad with it. And it's very, very good. So thank you very much for coming here to share your thoughts. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, our next speaker is Alain St. Jacques. Alain. Thank you. thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. <sighs> Thank you for the opportunity to address the uh, Board of Health. Um, I uh, approached this um, 
Today I'm going to talk about a very unglamorous topic, solid waste, food waste, food waste particularly. So Toronto Food Policy Council brings together th about 30 individuals who represent a wide range of occupational categories, expertises within the food system, local food systems. And I was appointed based on my work as uh, a market researcher in public opinion and behavior across Canada and elsewhere on food systems primarily and also solid waste. Uh, I go back to the days of the introduction of the blue box and um, doing research on the focus has been diversion, divert, divert, divert. Get the stuff in the blue box as much as possible, keep it out of landfill. And then we started to pay attention to the, the organic waste. So what was introduced was leaf and yard waste collection and backyard composters, nice idea, but didn't really take off, not practical for half of Toronto households. Um, so then the green bin system was introduced. And we, which is a great idea, okay, we get it out of there fast. And um, we started to look at this. I mean, again, we're, we're experts, so I am, um, a real nerd around solid waste, and reading uh, studies out of the UK, RAP, on they'd been digging into uh, food waste, uh, particularly in households, but in um, food processors. And they discovered that about at least a third to a half, it depends on the stream, is edible food waste, edible. Uh, we're not talking carrot tops, we're talking carrots. And um, subsequently, these are very expensive, very complex studies to do, extremely hard. And data started to appear in Canada. So the focus became food waste. We've got to do something about this. Great that people are, have adopted the green bin, but look what they're putting in it. So we deputed, I deputed on behalf of Toronto Food Policy Council back in 19, sorry, uh, 20, uh, March 19th, 2013. And um, made a case at that point, Toronto was really pressed, as many municipalities are in the, in the province, 70% waste reduction goal set mandated by the provincial government. We were only achieving 49, uh-oh. Um, and how were we going to do that? Then you start looking at uh, what is in the waste stream and we started to look very closely at organic waste. Um, and this is very interesting. Dr. Ralph Martin from the University of Guelph, Loblaw Chair, Sustainable Food Production, estimated that the weekly basis of the average family of 2.1 households are wasting, and this was at 2013 um, figures, $28 per week on edible food. That has now gone up to over $30. And uh, again, I mean, this is, this is edible food. So now this is, well, close to $2,000 a year. And recent data is showing that given the lack of rising incomes, but the fixed costs of living are going up and up, the one expendable area is food and 50% of shoppers and this is um, a random sample I did some work on this throughout Ontario over 50% are saying they are spending less on food now than they did the year before 
And Ellen, you're just over five minutes. Uh -oh. Perhaps if you could give us to summarize in one glorious up. Okay. sentence. Okay. Uh, the opportunities for saving money in solid waste budget are tremendous, but there's also the opportunity to save greenhouse gases, um, water, soil, and energy. So Toronto Food Policy Council, this report that we did subsequently helped inform the long-term waste reduction strategy and was, has been incorporated into the food strategy. Great. So I thank you to, very much. Thank you very thank much, you. Ellen. Uh, questions for Ellen? Okay, seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Joe Nasser from the Toronto Urban, Urban Growers and Centre for Studies in Food Security. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. I read my notes to stick to the five minutes. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to share with the members of the Board of Health a long view of the Toronto Food Policy Council using my personal perspective. I have been involved in urban food issues since the early 1990s when I took part in preparing a report for the United Nations on the state of urban agriculture around the globe. Already at this early stage, over a quarter century ago, I learned about the role of Toronto in developing urban food policies and strategies. By the time I moved to Toronto myself, a decade later, the city's leadership in this regard was further cemented. I started attending meetings of the TFPC ever since, and these meetings have provided me with an invaluable platform to learn about a variety of food system issues in the city and they connected me with a cross-section of the actors who are trying to tackle these issues. Building on my prior work in urban agriculture globally in and in North America, I quickly immersed myself in the emerging urban agriculture movement in the city, and the TFPC served as an amazing space to help me with this process. It also enabled me to broaden my particular focus on urban food production connecting me to many other pieces of the urban uh, food system puzzle. As I traveled to various cities around the world, when I would meet people working on various food challenges, inevitably the TFPC would click, uh, quickly come up in conversation. So by the time I became a member of this council myself a few years ago, it was clear that the TFPC has been serving as the leading model for how a municipality can create a platform that enables its, its citizens, decision makers, and municipal staff to bring up a wide range of challenges and discuss ways to address them. So one highlight for me was when I represented the TFPC at the launch of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact four years ago, uh, when Councillor Wong Tam signed the pact on behalf of the city. I see this as, a moment, as the moment when the role of cities, and particularly municipal governments, in food policy had finally become undeniable, and Toronto and the TFPC had laid the ground for this to happen. However, over time, despite its shining reputation, Toronto, I hate to say, has fallen behind some other cities in the capacity available uh, for supporting the fast-growing food system needs. Through my involvement for over a decade in Toronto Urban Growers, which Rhonda mentioned, this city's, which is the city's urban agriculture network, I have come to recognize the critical obstacles that the fast-expanding urban agriculture sector has been fa uh, facing, many uh, of them emanating from municipal regulations, among other. So to, uh, Councillor Wong Tam's question earlier, yes, there are any number of things that emanate from within the city as obstacles. Uh, similarly, the food system dimensions of addressing everything from poverty reduction to health improvement to climate change medication are becoming increasingly evident. So meanwhile, the staff and other support from the city to the food system has been shrinking rather than growing just as its critical importance has finally started to become recognized. I'll just cite one example 
uh, to give a sense of the, the lagging behind in that sense. Um, Baltimore, a far less wealthy city with, with less than a quarter of Toronto's population, has gone from a part-time grant-funded food policy director in 2010 to six full-time funded positions strategically placed across three agencies today. So to conclude, I urge the Board of Health not only to renew its continued support for the vital role that the TFPC as well as the Toronto Food Strategy have been providing for nearly three decades, but to spearhead a broader review of the inadequate support that the city uh, of Toronto across its various divisions and uh, agencies is now providing for strengthening the, its food system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions for Joe? Uh, yes, Director Wong Tan. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And Joe, thank you. Uh, thank you for the reminder that the City of Toronto was uh, one of the 206 cities that signed the, Mer the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact back in 2015. Uh, would you say that, um, because I, I think you, you already alluded to it, but um, with respect to the city's progress in addressing its uh, food insecurity, um, what more could we have done uh, to, to really action out the, the protocols um, and the action plan and the framework for action that was um, embedded in the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, which is very similar to what's happening in the conversations around the C40? Well, uh, I mean, the, there was a lot that had been done that actually many other cities was just getting started uh, back then. So we're not starting from nothing. There, a lot of the work of the, of the food strategy, for instance, um, as well as the TFPC in kind of defining frameworks and overall needs. I mean, coming up with uh, something like the Grotio Urban Agriculture Action Plan, uh, uh, which the TFPC uh, was uh, the lead on it, took part in. Uh, all of that laid the groundwork, so we're ready to start on all kinds of things. We know what a lot of needs are, and since then we have done more, uh, uh, again, through some very tiny support that we've received in coming up with what range of indicators might be needed, uh, uh, for instance, for urban agriculture, to, go, to address your earlier question, or um, uh, uh, what, what, is, what are the, the sc scope of um, uh, agencies that are connected? I mean, amazing diagrams that the team of the food strategy has come up with. So we know all of this. What hasn't really happened since then is translating that into uh, um, committed resources, both staffing as well as uh, uh, training, I mean, for instance, if planning is increasingly recognized as a critical issue, uh, the training of planners to address the challenges hasn't happened yet. In fact, we haven't really met with planning, the planning department to even bring this up as a critical issue. Uh, uh, and similarly, I'm sure there are, within every department, kind of the, the embedding that needs to be done uh, on one hand, so department by department, agency by agency, but at the same time, uh, a, a, the cross-cutting um, uh, support, reinforcing the, the capacity for, through the food, uh, food strategy and food policy council. We don't need to invent that. This is there. Reinforcing, that's why I was call, saying for going further in, in, uh, in enabling the existing platforms to, uh, uh, to do their work and take it further in, in being uh, much more deeply the connectors to the world of the city, uh, between the world of the city and the world of the citizen to, uh, to, uh, uh, to make things happen. So with respect to the research, the policy uh, development, all the bigger thinking uh, to, to, to inform actions, all that has been done. Well, there's always more to, to be done, but a lot of it has, has been, been done that has then not yet necessarily been put into action. So, so it sounds to me that perhaps the, 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 the gap in terms of taking the big policy thinking, a lot of it has been done, is to actually operationalize and implement across all the city divisions, like very similar to what was said um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in our earlier speakers. That's correct? I think there's countless operationalizing yeah. that 
that I can think of, absolutely, in, in uh, everything from the market to food waste to, uh, to urban agriculture and, uh, and, and to the cross-cutting pieces across these silos. And actually crossing the silos being itself one of the hardest. So I think the conversation around food security and, and the work that the, the Toronto Food Policy Council does is, is actively reviewed here at the Board of Health. Uh, but we don't generally have this big discussion on the floor of City Council or at the Executive Committee. So there are some councillors that are represented and obviously the city has adopted the policies um, and, the, and, and received the reports from the, the council. But with respect to city-wide direction where all the 44 divisions will be reporting back to the executive or to the respective standing committees or to council, that doesn't happen. So with respect to the, the political governance and, and the political power that would drive the outcome, we're not getting to those decision makers. Would you say, would you agree with that? I think so. I mean, that's partially because of the complexity. I mean, we're all kind of learning by doing over, over time in terms of the complexity. Uh, um, and to some extent, like some of the challenges, we're recognizing them only as projects are being put forward. So that's why we started uh, coming up with case studies of the you know, individual projects that either have given up, someone proposing something and something not happening, or they did make it happen, but it was after an arduous process that didn't need to be arduous. So we have some of this information that then is informing, so to enabling us to go beyond the, let's say, the general level of what we know generally are needed to specific cases and how uh, these can illustrate what obstacles need to be uh, overcome. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Thank you, Joe. Uh, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Fiona Udall from the School of Nutrition at Ryerson University. Thank you. Welcome. I see I'm on the agenda twice, but I'll only speak once. How's that? Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak to you today regarding the importance of the, both the Toronto Food Policy Council and the Toronto Food Strategy that I've seen in my work as a registered dietitian, an educator of future food and nutrition professionals, and a researcher focusing on sustainable livelihoods and food systems in relation to food and nutrition security. I live in Ward 4, and I work in Ward 13 at Ryerson University, where I'm director of the School of Nutrition and associate in the Centre for Studies in Food Security. And as I think about what I want to say today, I'll, I'll share with you something I heard from then director of the World Food Program. Vision without resources is a hallucination. <laughs> and that's what... <laughs> so that was what I used when I applied to be director of the school as well, of School of <laughs> Nutrition. But I think it's very important. We have the policies. We know what to do. What we don't know is how to do it, right? So it's very exciting to be here. I can talk about, I work on the Sustainable Food Systems Leadership Team of Dietitians of Canada, and I can tell you it's been a struggle for some people to realize that a dietitian's expertise is not enough to solve this. This is complex. This involves so many things. The, the strength of food is it touches everyone and everything. The weakness of food is it touches everyone and everything, so it has no home, and it can be easily overlooked. So your challenge is how to keep this going in the face of austerity or whatever we're in, um, because the work, it's, it's not as glamorous, right? Being a platform for collaboration, being a catalyst for action is not quite as exciting for people. It doesn't capture the public imagination as much. Um, and figuring out how to speak different sectors and different disciplines languages is not, is, it's hard work. It's relationship building. And that's what the, the infrastructure that Debbie referred to through the Toronto Food Policy Council, more recently the Toronto Food Strategy, has enabled Toronto to do that. I can't tell you how many times I've sat at national tables, at international tables, and when people hear I'm from Toronto and we're talking about sustainable food systems, they're, you're so lucky. 
And I know I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky that I am right next door to where they're headquartered. So I can engage my students, some of whom are here, and you'll hear speak later. Um, I can give them hope. When we're talking about food systems and the negative externalities of uh, when highly processed, highly uh, high in added fat, sugar, and salt food is an ec rational economic choice, that can seem overwhelming. When we have a food system that can deliver food from anywhere, irregardless of the season, for people who can afford it, there are costs to that. And when I talk to students about these challenges, sometimes I feel like I'm stealing their puppy. Well, I thought local food was good when we're talking about migrant farm workers because Canadians won't work in those conditions. So what the Toronto Food Policy, and this isn't just about me making my life easier as an educator, because when I'm talking about these things, I can point to the example of the Toronto Food Policy Council and the Toronto Food Strategy and the great work that it has catalyzed and it continues to do. So I would urge you to think, because you are the Board of Health, so you know better where the best position of this is, you know better, and I don't need to tell you that if a problem ends up on your desk, it's because it's not easy to solve. Right? So it's not an easy task of where to position it, how do we need a Ministry of Food? I mean, I don't know what the answer is. But what I do know is that the, this infrastructure that you've built has enabled a lot of convening and a lot of partners that not, would have not necessarily have interacted with one another to learn each other's language and to think about what is possible. So I'll just end with, um, Recently, I took um, my 12-year-old and a bunch of her friends and some of our friends, we went on the climate march because we wanted to give, there's a lot of anxiety in children of that age that, you know, climate crisis is too big, I can't do anything. And I thought it would make her feel better to see lots of people there. It made her more stressed out. So we need to do more. And food is a natural way to link planetary and individual health. So I'll leave you with that last thought. Vision without resources is hallucination. So thank you for your time. Sorry, I went over. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, and with deep regrets to the audience, I'm afraid at the Board of Health, we don't allow noise and clapping and cheering. I would encourage you to use jazz hands uh, to express your gratitude for awesome quotes like that one. Um, any questions? Yes, uh, Director Wong. Thank you very much for your presentation. So um, we have heard quite a few with, uh, deputants this morning about the report. One area we have not heard, and we saw the presentation from Rachel, is that we have this title called Toronto Continues to be the Child Poverty Capital of Canada. That's not the title we should have. So as a researcher, what can we do more? You know, because you have the data. So what can you advocate to this board? Because I just saw the recommendation from the Medical Office of Health, because this is not acceptable. And this is not fair. And this, the youngest citizen in this city is not being fed. So as a researcher, as an educator, what can you recommend to this board to address this issue? This is a systems failure. So when you see a system failure, you see the most vulnerable paying the price. So that is going to be children, for example. It's not acceptable. It's, it's appalling that we live in a society where children have to go to school um, and not, and we've tried, we've tried, we've had 30 odd years of a charitable response, which is not working. Not only does it lead to humiliation, so one of the things that we talk about in classes, I have students, and this is where I feel like I'm taking away their puppy, because they're like, how many people have volunteered at a food bank? All the hands go up. How many people, so think about what it feels like when you say, today I went to the food bank and volunteered versus picked up food for the week. So the charitable response is not enough. 
The, the food bank sector has amazing resources and has got dedicated people and people want to do right. They want to do what's right. But that system hasn't worked. We haven't always had, when I was growing up, back in the, a while ago, I just turned 52 yesterday. Um, so, thank you. Um, we would do a food drive at, at my church, but it wasn't the system that came into place now. How can we leverage that system? You've got places like the stop, the North York Harvest Food Bank that are transforming into something else. Ultimately, people have to have enough money to buy food. So that's an income solution if there's child hunger. Um, but in the meantime, there are other ways that people, I've also worked in, I worked in public health in the 90s and worked with a Healthiest Babies Possible program where what I found was by working with women and giving them, taking away that opportunity cost of experimenting with new foods and having them be able to cook and be able to share with other people, you saw them start taking control over other aspects of their food. So that's the other power of food to build confidence and to build a case of a sense of self-efficacy. So Rhonda talked about sharing your zucchini and, and how that feels. So really food is a vehicle for that kind of empowerment. It's not gonna solve it because it's, it's, it's a failure of the system. It's inequity. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Are there any other questions? No? Thank you very much for your presentation. We really appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is Sarah Watson from the North York Harvest Food Bank. Sarah, welcome. I'm just going to start your clock. When you're ready, uh, you have five minutes. Uh, good morning, members of the Board of Health. Uh, my name is Sarah Watson. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at North York Harvest Food Bank. And I'm here today on behalf of our Executive Director, Ryan Noble. He's out of the country and not able to be here himself, but he asked me to read this on his behalf. North York Harvest Food Bank is the primary provider of emergency food support across northern Toronto. Last year, through our member agency network, we provided food assistance to over 40,000 individuals. We received no public funding from any level of government for our core operations. Uh, Ryan is currently a member of the Toronto Food Policy Council and has worked with uh, Toronto Public Health's Toronto Food Strategy Department for many years. This deputation is to provide a perspective of a privately funded NGO as to the importance of having robust, sophisticated resources for the Toronto Food Strategy and Food Policy Council, given the impact that their work has on the lives of the people that we serve. Allow me to provide a few concrete examples. In 2012, using research from Food Strategy, we completed a mapping project to identify key food assets and needs in our community. And as a direct result, we opened three community food spaces in Lawrence Heights, Bathurst and Finch, and Don Mills and Shepherd neighborhoods that were shown to be dramatically underserved. These sites are now among the busiest food banks in Toronto, each serving thousands of people each month and providing wraparound programs, supports, and referrals that directly improve the health and well-being of low-income community members. Without the research provided by Toronto Food Strategy, we would likely never have moved forward with these facilities and left thousands of people to further struggle with food insecurity. And the tools developed through this project are still in use today by us and partner organizations around the city. In 2015, through the Food Policy Council, we provided significant input into the city's poverty reduction strategy, thereby ensuring that the lived experience of our clients and community members was well represented in the plan. And more recently, in 2018, we entered into a strategic partnership to operate Food Reach, a wholesale food purchasing portal designed with research and input from food strategy and supported by the Food Policy Council to increase the amount and variety of nutritious food to nonprofit agencies in the city. Last year, through this work, we successfully responded to an RFP from the city to deliver fresh produce, milk, and eggs to 30 drop-in centers as part of the Shelter Support and Housing uh, Creating Health Plus program. Again, this would not have been possible without strong partnership and collaboration with Toronto Food Strategy. In these and other, in these and other cases, the support and partnership we receive from Toronto Food Strategy and the Food Policy Council have been, excuse me, have been essential to our ability to work and see beyond the most immediate emergency needs of our community members. 
to better understand and address food insecurity in our city and to work towards actual long-term solutions and better health outcomes for some of our most vulnerable community members. TFPC and food strategy reports both state that there is no financial input, impact. Um, well, that might be true from the perspective of the city budget, I want to convey that there's a tremendous multiplier effect that occurs through the partnerships and collaborations that both have with organizations like North York Harvest. Not only have the examples mentioned, each provided vital services to thousands of Torontonians struggling with poverty and food insecurity, but if we help only a tiny fraction of these people to avoid the type of illnesses that stem from inadequate food and nutrition, we will have recouped any expense many times over. Moreover, none of the examples I've cited require any discretionary funding from Toronto Public Health. However, all required partnership with dedicated resources at the Food Policy Council and Food Strategy Department, who could provide a sophisticated understanding of our local food systems, as well as ability to convene the appropriate connections at Toronto Public Health and City Hall. As a leader of a nonprofit organization, a resident of Toronto and a taxpayer, I believe that the Toronto Food Strategy and Food Policy Council act as key enablers for organizations like North York Harvest, multiplying and enhancing vital food security work that we would otherwise be limited to execute on our own. From the perspective of population level health and equity, I believe that they generate incredibly high returns. And to that end, I would like to request that the Board of Health instruct the Medical Officer of Health to continue to make the food systems work of the Toronto Food Policy Council and the Toronto Food Strategy a priority and commit staff resources with food systems and food policy expertise to lead this work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Sarah? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Um, next up, and we have two speakers coming up together on the green sheets. We have Maria Jude from the Toronto Youth Food Policy Council, as well as Zartasha Zainab from the Toronto Youth Policy Council, who are coming up together, uh, which means you'll have 10 minutes combined, so however you so choose. Right. <laughs> uh, and thank you for being here. Whenever you're ready, you can start. Okay. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, so my name is Maria Jude, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Toronto Youth Food Policy Council. I was also lucky enough to have Fiona Udall as a professor and Debbie Fields as a mentor for <laughs> projects that I launched uh, together with a lot of very passionate students at Ryerson. So um, I'd like to start, actually that was just to give you an idea of how important the reach of the Toronto Food Policy Council is in encouraging youth to really be involved and become activists. So um, as a brief history, the Toronto Food Policy formed the Toronto Youth Food Policy in 2019, uh, sorry, 20, 2009, as a response to the growing need to have young people engaged in food issues. Uh, Rod Marcia, coordinator of the TFPC from 1991 to 1998, felt that the muni municipal process of the TFPC would greatly benefit from the inclusion of youth and stated, as adults who may have been involved with the movement for many years, many council members may stop looking at issues in a fresh way, while youth often bring a fresh perspective and creative ideas. Uh, this led to two master students, Tracy Filippi and uh, Ashley Andrade, to begin an internship with the Toronto Food Policy Council and to find a way to engage the youth. And eventually that led to the creation of the Toronto Youth Food Policy Council in September 20, 2009. <laughs> Uh, this allowed youth to address challenges faced by youth related to the food system, including food security, sustainability, urban agriculture, nutrition liter literacy, um, and farmland preservation, just to name a few issues. Uh, the youth are the ones that will inherit these problems associated with unsustainable food systems, so they should definitely be involved in the decision-making process. Um, so the Toronto Youth Food Policy pu um, publishes two youth journals, an academic journal, a peer-reviewed journal, and a creative arts journal. These journals provide a space for youth to showcase their work, um, a space that is typically dominated by experienced academics and professionals. We provide a space for youth to engage and become more involved with the local food systems and provide, uh, pro provide and speak with leaders in the food movement through our connection with the Toronto Food Policy Council. We provide capacity building, opportunities for council members through event planning, deputation experience, project management, as well as teamwork. In the past three years, there have been two businesses started by youth on the council, an urban farm and a popular zero waste market in Toronto. None of these would have been possible 
Without the support of the Toronto Food Policy Council over the years, the Toronto Youth Food Policy Council is now into its 10th year and we hope to continue to have this opportunity to work with professionals and the Toronto Food Policy Council. Thank you so much. I think that would probably be all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions for our speakers? So I, I have a couple, and it can be to both of you. Um, in terms of the Youth Food Policy Council, um, in your experience around uh, the next generation, how do people first get connected on the issue of food, food systems, and its interconnection? I mean, where is that starting point to get involved in food? And maybe where was your starting point? My starting point was actually as a nutrition student when I realized that uh, not everybody will have access to food and that was very frustrating. As Fiona mentioned, it was like taking away a puppy and like food banks don't actually provide a solution. So that's where I started looking into food security. Um, I also have a colleague here, Caitlin, who uh, is actually a law student and her interest actually peaked from um, interest in poverty and realizing that people struggle with food insecurity as well. Um, so my experience was a bunch of things. So I was like last last year I was I had the opportunity to do an internship with Councillor McKelvey, um, which also exposed me to like issues, local issues related to food food systems, food insecurity um, at like in the War 25. And at the same time, I was also working with my student union. So. Um, we had like two offices, so there was the Racialized Students Collective, and beside our office was the food center, and like every single day there were like almost like a hundred students lined up um, because they didn't have access to affordable food. And that just like showed how much, you know, the like youths are facing issues related to food insecurity. Like they can't, eat, they have to, because the student union was giving out free foods, so like it just, it just kind of helped, and it was the second year that the food center started, so it just kind of showed like the huge demand that young people are facing in just accessing food. Great. Thank you. Um, other questions? Yes, Director Wong. Thank you very much for your presentation. So I'm very pleased that the Toronto Food Policy Council established a very dedicated group for young people to have a voice on this issue that affects you greatly. So I asked a previous witness about the same question. How is your Youth Policy Council address this issue when we see that one in four young people are living below the poverty line and the fact is that 84% Indigenous children living in poverty, that's affecting your access to food. Is your Youth Council addressing this issue and how are you addressing it? Can you share with us? Uh, so as a council, we cannot uh, address the issue directly. I think that would definitely be addressed through things like uh, transformative social policy and something like basic income. But the, what we do do is uh, encourage youth to be more involved so that they can actually take up the seats in the future and make these decisions, as well as hosting events to actually spread the information and awareness about these issues and the actual uh, reasons why they exist rather than uh, just letting people understand that food banks work. So we do, in, we try to address it in numerous ways as well as engaging Indigenous youth in the Food Policy Council. Um, and yeah, maybe if you want to add, Zartash. <laughs> um, yeah, so I actually recently joined the Toronto Youth Food Policy Council and um, because I was also working as the Racialized Students Collective Coordinator, I realized that Indigenous people have a lot of like systematic barriers um, as, as well as like historical issues that have impacted their, you know, ability to have like access to um, affordable food. Um, and like one of the ways that I found that the Youth Policy Council has been addressing the issue is like uh, through community engagement and trying to like not just um, work, like not just have like, like, cause not just working here, but also like reaching out to the communities um, and make sure that we're also going out of our way to like go to those communities and make sure that they're part of the conversation and that they're like able to address those issues. Yeah, helping communities help themselves in a way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. 
Um, our final speaker on this item is uh, Marina Queer. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce your last name, and I don't wish to. So I will let you introduce yourself. My apologies. Yeah, I can do um, <laughs> from Evergreen. Hello, everybody, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. So I'm going to put my glasses on. My name is Marina Queirolo, and I'm speaking on behalf of, uh, as, a, as a Toronto resident that I am, fortunate to be, but also a senior officer at Evergreen, a national charity with more than 25 years of experience in urban issues, and a demonstration, demonstration hub at Evergreen Brickworks, where I have implemented various public market and food programs over the last 10 years. Imagine a network of all Toronto public markets working together to collectively advance regional food systems, inclusive local economies, social cohesion, and climate action, ensuring that every resident, no matter which postal code they live in, have equal access to fresh, locally produced food and a robust social infrastructure that supports inclusive, prosperous, and resilient Toronto for everyone. My passion is public markets. Why? Because public markets are places and spaces that allow for daily and weekly rituals of connections to many, many diverse people. They're places that promote physical and social health, advance sustainability, strengthen local economies, foster deeper relationships with the neighborhoods they serve. Toronto has more than 100 markets, ranging from the historical St. Lawrence Market to farmers markets, good food markets, and Kensington Market as our market district. In most cases, these markets are managed by community champions, and they're rooted in local action, so they really know what's happening in the neighborhoods. While loved by city dwellers and the, the wide widespread benefits, shoot, of uh, public markets remain relatively unknown and underappreciated. As such, many public markets exist on the margins. Cities like London and Barcelona are now investing in public markets. They recognize they're part of the civic common infrastructure that makes healthy cities and livable places that are inclusive for everyone. The Toronto Public Food Market Working Group was established in 2016 by the Economic Development and Culture, by, by Economic Development and Culture in partnership with the Toronto Food Policy Council. It is working to bring together organizations delivering public markets as well as farming organizations, business improvement areas, city staff from 10 different departments to unlock the potential of public markets in our city. In addition to being a great networking and collaboration opportunity for people that normally don't get together and don't work together, we are in the process of finalizing a report that will advise the City of Toronto Economic Development and Culture on barriers and opportunities to further develop public markets and a clear indication or direction on how the city can enable public markets to become the tool that they can be to advance not only their own priorities as market organizations, but also city priorities. This year, we were invited to present our work at the International P Public Market Conference in London, UK. Showcased, our work was showcased as a participatory approach to policy and program development, and inspired many thought leaders in the sector on how we were doing the work, uh, our, our bottom-up and collaborative approach to advancing this idea of a network of markets. 17 years ago, I moved to Canada from Argentina. Since then, I have been working tirelessly in delivering and advocating public, for public markets in the city. First, early on, I was inspired by the work of the Toronto Food Policy Council and the progressive uh, approach in bringing residents and practitioners' voice together into this hall. Now, I have the experience of seeing how having a connection at the city helps me as a social act activator uh, increase the impact of my work in my community. It's been a challenging year, 
and I'm encouraged by recent decisions to maintain the Toronto, a permanent position at the Toronto Food Policy Council. However, I'm here to stress the importance of having resources, time, money, and staff uh, to support collaboration between city staff and community experts like me, especially with the current climate tri crisis. Work like the one that I have been doing for the last three years in the Public Food Marketing Working Group cannot happen without city staff at residents at the table. And I'm going to ask you, we're just over five minutes, if you I'm could just say conclude very with a sentence. I want to stress the cross-divisional nature of food. As I said before, there are 10 divisions involved in regulating public markets, and they all need to be at the table at equal manner. For this to happen, we need a food policy staff, one or more if we can, and the Toronto Food Policy Council that brings the expertise from on-the-ground delivery. Just gonna, you're just coming up on six minutes. That's so. it. That is it. Thank That's you. That's it. Wonderful. Uh, questions? We have Director McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Evergreen does a lot of community engagement sort of work. Um, could you maybe speak to what sort of educational or community engagement you have around food? Um, and is it associated with the market or separate? So um, all our, well, most of our food programs, um, range, well, they all range from food growing all the way to food celebration. And in every aspect, the markets are included because they are the anchor where most of our activities happen. Whereas if we're speaking to um, a urban agriculture, we're anchoring the markets in the issues of how urban growers don't have access to uh, sell traditionally uh, at farmers markets or any other public markets in the city. Um, also, we use our public markets as a place where education happens. It's a place where eaters connect with growers, but also eaters talk to one another about the benefits of cooking every day and changing their behavior towards food. So yes, public markets, we do many food programs, but public markets are at the anchor because it's the place where people come together. And what are, who, who sells at your, market, your markets right now? Like what, who are the vendors? And like, for example, if you grow food in your backyard, could you go and sell it at your market? Like what's, what's involved in, in becoming a vendor? So I'm gonna clarify two things. So yes, I am a senior officer at, at Evergreen and I can speak on behalf of the markets that we manage on site. Uh, but the initiative that we're talking at the Toronto Food Policy Council level, it's about involving all the markets, which are currently not connected and work, not working together. And I see as the social infrastructure that we need to have to distribute more fairly food across the city. So at Evergreen Farmers Markets and Public Markets, we have farmers that come from the surrounding region. We have a few urban growers. Um, which has been interesting because it's different, like there has to be a lot of education on uh, who regulates public markets so that they are allowed and counted uh, because currently um, public farmers markets across the city need to have 50% plus one farmers and many uh, public health uh, inspectors don't uh, understand that local growers are um, farmers too. And so it, that can change within the city and depend on the person that goes in, in, in and inspects the market. Okay. Thank you. And Thank you very That's much. one of the barriers that we're trying to address in consistency across the city in terms of the regulatory, the body, but the understanding of how the rules are implemented. Just follow yeah. up. And on that front, would you, in your recommendations that you have coming forward to economic yeah. development, will we be talking about that as well? Yeah, so we're talking about having a very specific um, set of regulations and permits that, first of all, classify the different typologies of markets that we have, so there's an increased understanding on their differences, but also that they need a very specific stream because they're currently seen as an event, a special event. So if you're hosting a beer market or if you're hosting like a good food uh, market bringing healthy foods, they're regulated by the same body and they're, all the nuances of each one of these markets are just clustered and misunderstood. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you very much to all our deputants. We're now going to move this into committee for questions of staff.
Uh, are there any questions of city staff at this point? Um, okay, seeing none, I'm going to come to myself. Um, there's a question that's being raised regarding staffing levels related to uh, Toronto Public Health and the uh, Food Policy Council. What staffing levels have been in place over the last number of years, both full-time and administrative support for the coordination roles? So thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. I may act to get all the specifics in respect of the number of staff for the program over the years, I will have to refer to my colleagues around the room. But if I may, I'd just like to take a little moment here um, to talk about how important we do feel this issue is at Toronto Public Health and that we actually agree um, wholeheartedly with what we've heard this morning around the need for staffing and, in fact, I think we've heard quite a bit about how a policy approach is really needed for a very complex issue such as food, food systems, human health and planetary health. So I can tell you that, uh, and I think my colleague is just coming up here to talk a little bit about the uh, resources that we've had over time. But I would like to say that that's exactly where we, when, uh, we'll hear a little bit about the resources of the past where I would like to go in the future and where we're trying to go in respect of Toronto Public Health is to in fact recognize that because this is such a complex issue, it does cry out for policy solutions. Um, I would say that generally, like most other city divisions, we're known as about, or people think of us. Uh, Dr. Udall talked about how uh, programs and services tend to capture the imagination. Policy and infrastructure don't. But these are very, very critical to food system issues, food, food systems, human health and planetary health. And I think what we're trying to do is bring these things together. Uh, you need nutritionists, yes. You need policy experts, yes. And you need many, many others around the table. So Barbara and Gail, Matt, I turn it over to you with respect to the specific FTEs and, and staff counts. Sure, thank you. So in terms of the Food Policy Council, there is a position called a health promotion specialist. And that is the one that has been functioning as a coordinator for the work of the Toronto Food Policy Council, the individuals that you heard depute today. That would be staffed to them as a council. There's also administrative support. I understand from uh, Barbara Manuel, who's joined me as the manager for the food strategy, that approximately half of that admin support goes to the Food Policy Council. Uh, going forward, as Eileen mentioned, the plan is to permanently replace the coordinator role, which has recently been vacated by Laurie, who's here, and um, to continue to look at the needs of this group, given the enormous workload that's come forward as a result of signing on to the various declarations that uh, you know, we're, we're very pleased to see both as public health and as a city. Can, can I just, so I, thank you, but I just want to be really get into the nitty gritty there. So there is a full time role which serves as a coordinator and uh, an administrative support position with it, th those two positions, is that right? Correct. Okay, and those two positions are being filled? It, one is vacant uh, and being filled. Uh, the other one, from what I understand, uh, let me let Barbara uh, jump into it, the administrative role. Um, the uh, admin person uh, is, has left that role and has not been filled as yet. So we have uh, both positions currently vacant, uh, but hopefully will be filled. Okay, those are all my questions. Other questions? Uh, yes, Director Donaldson. Speaking in, speaking in terms of FTE, is that two FTEs? Actually, so if I may, uh, through the chair, the answer is, is that you have one full FTE and half of another one. And I think the uh, interesting thing here, as I mentioned earlier, is that we're trying to bring the full resources to bear. Uh, we talked a little bit about how um, uh, public health is generally known in respect of programs and services, and we have a significant, uh, and have had for a long time, uh, a significant uh, chronic disease and nutrition program. So what I think we're trying to do here and what I'd like to talk to the board about is uh, bringing together these two houses, very similar to what we've seen and you'll see in some of the upcoming reports that we're about to discuss, whether we're talking about the Eat Lancet Commission on the Planetary Health Diet or whether we're talking about Canada's Food Guide. In fact, 
We're recognizing, as are many other partners globally, that what's important is that if we're going to deal with that healthy diet, sustainable food production, and a transformation of the global food system are all part and parcel, and they need to be done by a series of experts. Yes, from the uh, practice of nutrition. Yes, from policy. And yes, from other city divisions as well. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay. Uh, oh, uh, Director McKelvey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I was just wondering if you could give clarification on the number of positions. How many FTEs is that? That would be two, two FTEs, so one for the coordinator. And then I understand that the uh, admin position as, is half supporting food strategy and half supporting drug strategy, but we're certainly... Okay, so it's 1.5 FTEs correct. towards Toronto Food Policy. Yep. And how many um, members are there of the council? It's a 30-member council. Uh, but what I should point out is that the staffing for the Food Policy Council is integrated into the food strategy team. We operate together. Um, and so when you start to pass out FTEs, how much goes to the Food Policy Council, how much goes to the food strategy, frankly, it's one and the same in many instances in terms of incubating new initiatives. But direct support to the TFPC is a full-time health policy specialist and an admin support that's currently empty. And then, so you have 30 participants on the Food, food Council, which is fabulous. I attend as many as I can. Um, so that's a pretty big in-kind contribution that we have from these volunteers, right? Because it meets month monthly, pretty much monthly. Um, yes, it's a huge in-kind contribution. And if you do go to Food Policy Council meetings, it's a lot more than the 30 members of the council there. Uh, council meetings are open to the public, and it becomes a very spirited, engaged platform for deep conversation, movement building, connections making, information sharing. So um, they have a monthly open meetings, um, and uh, there are various subcommittees uh, that uh, operate in between meetings and work very closely with other city divisions and with the uh, food strategy team. And they are, and I, and I can comment that they are incredibly engaged, just out, even outside of the meetings that are held. Um, I, I know because I MCC'd on all those emails, so I see, I see the very, very um, uh, stimulating conversations that are continuing between them, between the meetings. So um, I, I think there's there's a huge inclined contribution by these very engaged citizens that I just wanted to point out here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions for staff? Okay, we're going to take this in for speakers uh, to speak. Director Wong Tan. Yes. Um, my apologies. Um, yes, I'd like to move a motion, and uh, there should be no surprise at this point, considering the questions and the answers, uh, pretty much the conversation we had here at the Board of Health um, on the uh, the system gaps. Um, it's to direct the motion is to, to ask City Council to direct the City Manager to consult with the Medical Officer of Health and the subject matter experts to review all to instruct all City divisions to review the Toronto Food Policy 2019 Annual Report and to support their other reports to develop a food lens for the respective work by the end of 2020, that's a one full year, to leverage divisional work uh, to support the objectives of eliminating food insecurity and addressing the climate emergency across the City of Toronto, and then to have the Medical Officer of Health to report back to our board in the first quarter of 2021. Um, it's a bit of a long uh, time frame, but I think because we're going to be socializing the idea with the divi different divisions, it may be the very first time we're actually initiating the conversations. We don't want to rush the work, but we want to make sure that there is enough time to do the work. Um, and because of the Medical Officer of, of Health report,
reports directly to our board uh, after she comes back to us in 2021, we're going to have to figure out how to push it back out to the rest of City Council and all the standing committees to make sure that the divisions can uh, embrace the policies. Um, and I just want to thank the uh, the deputants for, for everything that you've been doing. Um, and, uh, and clearly, I think uh, Joe, um, Dr. Nazar and Dr. Yala probably captured it the best. It's like the, the thinking has been done. The frameworks have been have been developed. And yes, there is still more to do. Uh, but now it's time to turn all of that good thinking, all of these uh, international best practices, and bring it home locally. And then to make sure that the city can actively get involved uh, with respect to uh, eliminating uh, food insecurity, uh, developing uh, sustainable food uh, systems by promoting everything that we've already said we wanted to do. Um, so it's not a matter of the fact that the City of Toronto hasn't said we'd like to do this. It's the fact that we just haven't. And that means that we have to resource it. We've got to fund it. We've got to be able to work, work and leverage with the incredible communities of, uh, of interest that uh, are very um, committed to making this happen. Uh, and we need to be able to figure out what's worked, uh, how to scale it up, and how to export it to some communities that have not even started to, to work on community gardens and other uh, food systems. So I think this is, um, to me, uh, probably uh, the time where we can try to tie all the different policies together, whether it's Grow TO, uh, whether it's the, uh, the, the poverty reduction strategy at the City of Toronto, because uh, we can't necessarily have these strategies floating out there without landing in some place. And I, I forget the, the deputy who spoke about it, uh, but the fact that it, it's so important and it touches everybody and yet there's no home for it. So the political championship, I think, has been sort of at the Board of Health, but the Board of Health doesn't necessarily talk to uh, city community planning, is not in conversation directly with Toronto Water, is not always in direct conversation and focused in, in this particular subject matter around green space, parkland, um, all of that with respect to how much money is even being spent across the city developing uh, new infrastructure, but also repurposing existing infrastructures. So if there's a way for us to do it better, to leverage all those city strengths, to make sure we can get multiple bottom line positive outcomes, uh, this is probably the best way for us to do it. I am just going to say that I have been on the receiving end of a number of frustrating conversations, and I don't believe there's any enemies here. I think it's just a matter of the fact that our divisions work in silos. And sometimes it's about you know, TCHC, which is one of the largest landowners in the City of Toronto. The City of Toronto is one of the largest landowners in the City of Toronto, not to mention the fact that we've got the Ontario government, the Canadian government, every single one of us owns real estate. And I would say that we're not performing in, ter in terms of making sure that the real estate can produce uh, multiple uh, possible benefits. Um, and those frustrating conversations have been convening interested and energized community partners who want to develop uh, uh, urban agricultural programs, whether it's in TCHC buildings or perhaps exploring aqua aquaponics uh, programs um, or perhaps even working with our school boards. Um, I've got a site in Regent Park that's 3.44 acres in size. Uh, it's sitting at the corner of, um, of Sh Sherburn and Parliament. It's a TCDSB site, and it's taken five years to just have a conversation about what to do with it, and it's been sitting fallow for those five years. A waste of time, waste of energy, and, and yet we know that the community has said, let's do something great with it. They've got all the energy, and we just need to get to the table and start to say yes, and then map out the hows. So hopefully this will be um, a way for us to, to get there, um, but it means that we have to, when it comes back, make sure we shepherd it another step forward. So I'll look forward to doing that work with the community and also with the incredible staff at our, at, um, uh, through public health, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Light. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Councillor Wong Tam, for bringing this motion forward. I think you'll see in the next item we have a similar, I have a similar motion that tries to elevate the discussion and implementation so that it's not all sitting on the shoulders of public health who have in the last year taken a significant amount of pressure uh, on, on their budgets and, and, and their work. And I think we need to ensure that we recognize it's it's quite a bigger issue than than just one that, that needs a, a public health solution. Um, if you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you know food is a huge part of, of my regular daily life. My first deputation at Toronto City Council was in this room 12 years ago, sitting right there talking about local food. 
talking about the purchasing of local apples and the climate impacts uh, of that. I was, wasn't far off being a student, um, but I was here in an effort to try to better connect local farmers with the municipalities that they feed and using that procurement as the tool to unlock this, this connection. Unfortunately, I don't think we've actually gone as far as we would have liked to in that 12 years when we compare ourselves to other municipalities. My motion's on the next item. Um, so the second thing is I, I, I adore the urban agricultural model. If you come to my backyard, I have had planted or pulled out 60 garlic cloves this year. I've already planted 80 more for next year or 60, 67 more. 12 kale plants that keep a family of four um, with an overabundance of kale for the several months that you can harvest it, including and in continuing today. Um, six eggplant plants that I wish would do a little bit better, but they're eggplants. So, and 40 tomato plants, which feed a family of about 60 squirrels and my own <laughs> for the duration of the summer. Now that's, and I don't talk about it often, but on top of the, the canning I do, the, four, the 45 sopressata and the, uh, and the 10 pepperoni that, uh, that the chair and I made this past year and cured in my, in my basement. The granola bars I tweeted about earlier today, I, earlier this weekend that I made for my daughters. The limoncello I made, because you got to balance these things out. Um, and the fruit leather that was dehydrating this morning so that I could put in my daughter's lunch. Food is immensely, I call myself an urban homesteader. Because I like connecting the raw materials with a final product. And I, I say this because we've, we've done a lot of great community engagement in the city of Toronto. We've engaged our experts very well, I think, and have developed a world model for how to do that. But where we've lacked is in the delivery of resources. We've relied too much on volunteers. And I was having a conversation with, with Director Lai a second ago, who said she only had one community garden. I got about 12. But it wasn't necessarily because city staff were out there helping communities and engaging communities. You need to have um, almost outspoken community leaders that are willing to put their own time, or it just doesn't happen. So if we're serious about seeing it happen, we're going to train those volunteers, or we're going to start doing it ourselves. And, and really, we just can't continuously rely on the generosity of others. People are busy, and they get busier as their life goes on, and maybe get less busy later on in life, but th there, there's a balance there. So I, I think we have to pay way more attention to the level of resources that we're putting into this so that other people can enjoy some of the things that I do just because I have, have this strange obsession with urban homesteading. Um, I will remark that I just found out today, and it's just kind of funny that it lines up on today, that my spicy zucchini relish, all of which was grown in my uh, backyard except for the onions, came 12th at the Royal Winter Fair because the results were announced today. Now it's not my best showing, but there was more than 12 entries. So it's important <laughs> to recognize I wasn't last. Um, so I'll thank staff for this report. I have a similar motion coming up on the next item. Uh, we need to elevate this. There is too much, too much of our greenhouse gases are related to, um, to, to food to ignore it. Too much of the inequality in our city is, is related to access to food to ignore it. And, and it's becoming quickly an affordability piece that if we don't take action on now, it's gonna haunt us for, make us hungry for, for action. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to share updates on their own food growing? Uh, Director Wong. Well, I'm not a grower like Councillor Layton, Mr. Chair. I've been here on this board long enough to know when this Toronto Food Policy Council was created. So when you live long enough, you see it's growing, which is a good thing, Mr. Chair. I think I was very pleased to see Councillor Wong Tam your motion, because this issue, what we just um, been presented to us this morning by Rachel Gray. The whole issue of the system failure to our young people, that's not acceptable. I think equally said when the report comes back to 
uh, from the Medical Office of Health to the board in the first quarter as recommended by your motion, Council Wong Sam, is that we've got to hone down the action. Enough about more research. We have e research coming out of our ears. We need action to address how do we scale up, uh, you know, uh, Council Layton and then Council Lai. The fact is much of the urban growing is downtown city of Toronto, is not in the urban uh, suburb. The fact of the matter here is, as a former MPP, former board member in this board, we cannot allow the youngest citizen not be nourished. That's the number one issue. We are failing them. And equally said, I would say the, the, the impoverished seniors, because at the end of the day, those are the most vulnerable. If the young people are hungry, surely the seniors are hungry as well. So I think the, the fact is that, that this board has been led to deal with the Toronto Food Policy Council now for almost 30 years. And I'm glad that I'm still here to talk about this issue. But we gotta get other partners. Because the partners is not just about this Toronto Board of Health. Because now we just heard the, 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 the presentation from Helene uh, St. Jacques about the whole issue about food, food waste. I remember a report not too long ago, Mr. Chair, from the environmental commissioner talking about food waste. And the fact is that we, I remember doing a food audit at one of my schools in downtown Toronto. 40% of the waste was kids throwing the food because the parents made the lunch they didn't like. Instead of sharing that food, some kid may like, it was thrown in the garbage can. So the question has to be asked is, is this just the Toronto Public Health under the direction and leadership of the Medical Office of Health taking the leadership on this file? When every department, whether it is the long-term care division, community social services, everybody has to take responsibility. Because when one child is hungry, Everybody is affected. So I am very, very pleased that we are going to lead this conversation, but no more research. We've got to take some action, folks. When we have 84% of Indigenous children living in poverty and not getting proper food, we are now accountable to address this issue. And we cannot do this alone. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Director Lai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't going to speak, but I think I just want to echo on uh, Director Wong's uh, uh, message there. I think we need to, big time, we need partners. And uh, for the urban, I think we, you need to some of the suburban partners as well, because you know, that's the way to kind of spark the fire and make sure that the whole Toronto is, uh, is being, I'm very actually impressed being new on this board. And uh, I really was I didn't know, I mean, it's very good information for me, and I'm, I'm actually going back to my community, and, and it's a very, very good community engagement initiative, if you can think about it. I don't know whether the, the uh, uh, Toronto Pol uh, Food Council, Food Policy Council, have everybody from different wards, from different parts of Toronto that sits on the board. Uh, if no, I mean, you know, you probably all the you know different diversity, different different board. I think you know we need to spread the message as well because you know uh, there's other barriers, messages, messaging, messaging. I'll, I'll do my job, you know, do my messaging. And uh, but I think uh, it's a very good community, and then it's for the public health of the citizen of Toronto. And and I think I I will support uh, Councilor Wong Tam's motion because we need. Uh, Funding we need, uh, you know, uh, for all the um, and support the what they call it. I mean, uh, develop foot lens for the work by the end of uh, 2020. So we need to take some action on 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 this. So um, thank you very much, uh, Councillor uh, Chair, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Uh, seeing none, uh, I'll speak and first of all, I'll place my amendment, which is uh, that the Board of Health direct the Medical Officer of Health to continue staffing levels to support the TFBC, including coordination and associated administrative positions. Um, let me begin my remarks, first of all, by thanking all the deputants uh, and members of the Toronto Food Policy Council for, for your work this year and for years of work. I'm so delighted that we've had such a focused and comprehensive discussion today 
about food policy because, as has been said, fundamentally, when you're talking about food policy, we're talking about a healthy and a just and a sustainable city. It's all of those things. It's about equity and health promotion. It's about environmental sustainability. It's about community development, just as it's about local jobs and economic development. It all comes together. And it's in that context of that, that deeply comprehensive and complex interrelationship between food and justice and sustainability that the work of the Food Policy Council over 30 years, uh, not only has Toronto over those 30 years helped to, to demonstrate to the world how you can build a community up model for food policy. I think today, where we sit for the next 30 years, when you think about rising inequality, when we talk about child poverty and being the child poverty capital, when we talk about climate change and the fact that we don't have many years left and that greenhouse gas emissions, nearly 40% of them globally, come from food associated uses. It's now more important than ever that when we look to the next, not 30 years, but 10 years, that in Toronto, we bring all departments together to champion food security and a sustainable model. Um, I think to do that, when we look at Toronto Public Health, there's a couple pieces here. One is from us at TPH, certainly we need to make sure that we are staffed to the challenge and to the ambition we have. That's part of it. I think one, one item, and it's being raised here today, is where and how food policy sits within our work at Toronto Public Health. My new business item that has been circulated around, which we'll deal with, is in December, we're going to do a collective deep dive into the reorganization of TPH that the Board of Health requested. And so we're going to do that deep dive collectively in December to look at overall the reorg and the many different issues and departments that we have, including food. And that's going to be an opportunity for us to really delve into where food policy sits within TPH. But broader than this, and this is where I want to really commend and thank uh, Councillor Wong Tam for her motion, this, if we are to be successful on a more just and transformative food policy within the City of Toronto, it must be for all Toronto, across all departments in Toronto. And that's where I know this is hard. It, it, Toronto Public Health, we're often rolling rocks up hills, trying to get others to join us on that, on that work. But it's where if we don't ask, if we don't push, we get nowhere. And, and that's where I want to thank uh, Councillor Wong Tam for her leadership on that. And so with that, I'll co conclude my remarks with, to echo yet again, deep gratitude and thanks to the Toronto Food Policy Council. Uh, and I believe we can now move into uh, the amendments at hand. Um, and so, and I believe I'll start with um, Director Wong Tam's amendment. Clerks have advised that a slight change is needed. So you're withdrawing that and placing a new one. And perhaps yeah. that can be placed on the screen. And just for everybody's clarity, can you maybe just briefly share what's changed? Uh, yes, I can. And thank you very much, Chair. Um, the, and thank you to the city clerks for all the support in making sure we, we get the, the language of the motion right and also bringing the appropriate staff uh, to the table to work with our medical officer of health to report back. Uh, so essentially, the, um, the, the, the the, sort of the bigger changes here is that the, the request is going to the Deputy City Manager, um, Community and Social Services, the Deputy City Manager of Infrastructure Development Services, and the Deputy City Manager of Corporate Services in consultation of the Medical Officer of Health to report back on the, on the uh, preceding the right work. Yeah, it's, the, it's, item, it's motion four. Uh, and report back to our, our, our board in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, that's, to me, a, a much stronger, better, clearer motion. Uh, it, uh, it assigns um, uh, sort of titles to, to the actual work and how they're going to report back. Uh, and, and of course, thank you to our medical officer of health because she's got to now work across the multitude of divisions to make sure that everyone understands uh, what, is, uh, what is being requested of them. That's the, the original motion with withdrawn, and that is, as you see on the screen, the revised motion that is before us to clearly articulate all the divisions uh, as clerks as requested. So we have two amendments then in front of us. Um, do we want to take them as a package or do we want to take them separate? You know what, for this one, why don't we take this, and I, I'd suggest we do item recorded number four vote. with a recorded vote, if that's all right. Motion number four from Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, 
Director Donaldson, Director Johnson, Director Lai, Director Layton, Director Wontam, Director Cressy, Director Lepretti, Director McKelvey, uh, Director Perks, Director Wong, and Director Su Wong. Uh, that is unanimous. Uh, and then we have a second. All those, and this is from me on staffing, all those in favor, opposed, if any, that has carried. Uh, do we have anything else to do with on this item? Seeing none, that concludes this item. Thank you very much. We will now move to HL 10.2, Food Systems Transformation and Toronto Food Strategy 2019 update. We have a brief presentation um, and then a speaker as well. So the floor is yours when you're ready. So, uh, hi everybody. I'm going to do a quick presentation on the current update on the Toronto Food Strategy in the context of food system transformation. So what you see there is a timeline, and a lot of this has been uh, already discussed today, starting with the establishment of the TFPC, the establishment of the Food and Hunger Action Committee, which led to the Toronto Food Charter, then the uh, food strategy in 2010. And, and sorry to interrupt, could you just pull the mic so it's oh. pointed towards you? Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, and uh, the signing of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, along with 205 cities across the world. Um, and what we could do is uh, add the, uh, the food charter, which, uh, the food declaration. So the vision of the Toronto Food Strategy is to create a healthy, sustainable food system that meets the needs of all residents. This uh, report focuses on the food system transformation and climate action, but prior reports to the Board of Health have discussed in a lot more detail the way we work at the food strategy. Just to summarize, we take an action research approach to our work. So we try things uh, before we've collected every piece of evidence, although we are evidence informed. We incubate new initiatives uh, in partnership with many other stakeholders and uh, we do everything in collaboration with uh, others across the city, in the community, uh, including the TFPC. So as you heard, uh, at the C40 World Mayor's Summit on October the 10th in Copenhagen, our mayor, on behalf of the City of Toronto, signed the Good Food Cities Declaration, along with mayors from 14 cities across the world. And under that declaration, cities commit to aligning our food procurement policies to the planetary health diet, and ideally sourced from organic agriculture. We commit to supporting an overall increase of healthy plant-based food consumption in our cities, and we do this by shifting away from unsustainable and unhealthy diets. We commit to reducing our food loss and waste by 50% from 2015 figures. And that's a little bit complicated because we don't have firm baseline data. We are working with our colleagues across the city in solid waste particularly. And most important, this is about working with citizens, private sector, other organizations to develop a joint strategy and incorporating this strategy into our Climate Action Plan, Transform TO. So the food strategy uses a systems approach to promote a sustainable, equitable, and healthy food system. So that means our food systems must transform. We have to promote resilience, which means addressing both shocks and chronic stresses in the context of climate change, but ongoing stresses like food insecurity. 
Climate action is absolutely essential, as we've been talking about, and we must bring an equity lens to everything that we do. Because as we well know, the most vulnerable residents all over the world are disproportionately impacted by climate change and chronic uh, food insecurity and poverty. So we have a very strong foundation that we build, building on. We've done a food vulnerability assessment of our system in Toronto. Uh, the Eat Lancet Commission report, Food Planet Health, uh, was cited earlier, but points to the fact that food is the single strongest lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability on Earth. So to put it in a very intuitive way, our actions must take into account both human and planetary health with an equity lens. And if that is what guides us, we'll make considerable progress. There's been a number of science reports in the last few months. Uh, the Eat Lancet was one, the C40s uh, Cities report, which is the future of urban consumption. And that, too, points to adopting dietary change as the consumption intervention with the greatest potential for emissions reductions. So areas of immediate action that we can take are in the areas of food procurement, food consumption, food loss and waste, and promoting resilience. None of this is new. We're doing a lot of work on all of these. It's just being more intentional and intensifying our efforts in multiple collaborative ways. Bridging these global targets, food metrics, and local city goals is a fantastic, food is a fantastic opportunity to do that. We've talked about the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, but food is a way to achieve the sustainable development goals and multiple of those sustainable goals. So when we look at procurement, what we're talking about here is specifically aligning food procurement to the planetary health diet. In the city of Toronto, we directly influence the procurement of about 7 million meals a year. And we have the potential to reduce our food-related GHG emissions by taking steps to providing more sustainable and healthier menu options through our own procurement and the consequent leadership role that we can take through that. The Cool Food Pledge is from the World Resources Institute, and it's about uh, helping cities and private sector institutions to take a pledge towards a science-based target for diet-related scope 3 GHG emissions. And what is highly significant here is that for institutions and uh, cities that do sign on to this Cool Food Pledge, the World Resources Institute will help us calculate those GHG emissions. So that's a really uh, a valuable uh, tool. Uh, they will bring a plan and help us bring a plan if we, so, uh, if we are so inclined as the City of Toronto to sign on to this pledge and will be part of many other organizations and institutions. I'd like to draw attention to, uh, this is a slide that came from the Cool Food Pledge. And if you look at that dark orange slice in there, it's hard to see, but it's 3% is ruminant uh, meat procurement from another institution. And if you look to the right with the same color, that 3% ruminant meat results in 49% of greenhouse gas emissions. So that's a really visceral way to understand that even small reductions in uh, meat procurement or, or procuring sustainably produced meat can, resu can result in quite substantial greenhouse gas 
reductions. So the proposed uh, strategies is that Toronto Public Health, which is the lead division for the food strategy, to work with uh, City of Toronto divisions right across to align food procurement to the planetary health diet, and ideally to sign the World Resource Institute Cool Food Pledge, and thus leverage this capacity for calculating and working with our colleagues in our environments and energy division who have already uh, um, integrated and are planning to do more work on food systems transformation, but to leverage that capacity to do some concrete calculations. On the consumption side, uh, this is something that Toronto Public Health does a considerable amount of work already uh, in supporting an overall increase in the consumption of healthy plant-based foods by shifting away from unsustainable and unhealthy diets and again linking back to the planetary health diet proposed by the Eat Lancet Commission and the uh, Owen Canada Food Guide which of course is very much in alignment with that. So our Canada Food Guide you see on the left is half the plate is uh, plant-based, healthier alternatives. And the work that we do through our nutrition promotion uh, is about influencing the entire food environment by addressing issues related to affordability, availability, the marketing and regulation of food, and of course, uh, dietary behavior and food choice. So the proposed strategies that we are looking at through this is that we would work in collaboration with other city divisions, with community and institutional partners to support an overall increase in the consumption of healthy plant-based foods and to shift away from unsustainable and unhealthy diets. In other words, as I said, food that's good for both people and the planet. On the food loss and waste piece, an, a 2019 study conducted by Value Chain Management in collaboration with Second Harvest found that a shocking 58% of all the food produced in our food system in Canada is either lost or wasted, which, result, which is about 35.5 million metric tons. This is shameful. What was significant about this study is that they were able to obtain data from private sector and throughout the entire food chain to actually come up with this. Um, the City of Toronto is, a, is now a partnership city with Ellen MacArthur Foundation's Circular Economy for Food. And in this regard, Toronto Public Health, in collaboration with Solid Waste Management Services and a number of external partners, are working together to make progress on circular economy for food. So our strategies, of course, must be developed to decrease food loss and waste in every single part of the, the food chain, from production to post-harvest handling, the processing and manufacturing, distribution and retail, as well as consumption. And this is the image for a circular economy for food, which requires sourcing food grown regeneratively and wherever possible locally designing and marketing healthier products and making the most of food. The critical role of food systems in a livable Toronto is outlined in our uh, first resilience strategy and food systems transformation links to a number of other strategies in addition to the resilience, including our poverty reduction strategy, our strong neighborhood strategy, and of course, transform TO. So in conclusion, cities play a leadership role in setting policies and guidelines 
and taking action and showing leadership in food procurement and consumption, promoting resilience and poverty reduction, and overall supporting population health. We can, at the city level, take really concrete steps to reduce food waste and loss, and we can align our food system transformation, climate change action, and resilience, and thereby build synergies, strengthen networks and partnerships, and facilitate new connections. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to we're going to go first to public deputations, and then we'll come back to questions of staff. But thank you for that exceptionally comprehensive presentation. Uh, we had uh, members. There were three names on the green sheets who had registered to depute. Since then, two who have already spoke have taken their name off the list. Okay. Uh, I will be calling everybody's name out, but thank you, Debbie. Um, our first speaker is Heather Marshall from the Toronto Environmental Alliance. Heather, come on up. Heather, you know the drill? Absolutely. You'll have five minutes when you're ready. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. And I know I'm standing between you and lunch, potentially, so I uh, hope you're uh, able to stave off your hunger. Um, the Toronto Environmental Alliance is here today because we strongly support the recommendations that are put forward by the Medical Officer of Health. And we want to commend Toronto for their commitment to join the C40 Good Food Cities Declaration. The timing is very critical. Transform TO, the city's climate action plan, is under consultation right now, and they're looking for feedback on the next three-year implementation strategy. One new component is looking at consumption-based emissions, and we do believe the food system in Toronto is the first critical area that we should be looking at from a consumption-based perspective, because it is so complex, but we've already done so much great work. Transforming the food system is a necessary part of Toronto's response to climate change. The food system needs to change in order to adapt to the impacts of climate change, like extreme weather, as well as to increase food security. But we also need to do it to significantly reduce these, green, these consumption based greenhouse gas emissions that was uh, in the presentation. We're talking about transform, transforming the way food is grown, produced, transported, and consumed in our city. And as you've already heard from so many speakers here today, many organizations and communities across Toronto already know the interconnections of food security, resilience, and climate change, and they've been tending to this work for many, many years. Community spaces are transforming lawns, parking lots, and rooftops into gardens. Some run their own good food markets. Some hubs in, have invested in commercial-grade kitchens to serve local growers and catering entrepreneurs. Not only are these leaders taking climate action, they're fostering resilience and a sense of community. They're breaking down social isolation, improving nutrition, and developing their communities. And I know it was pointed out around suburban initiatives and maybe the lack of some of those being profiled. So I wanted to draw attention to the fact that our organization's been organizing tours to bring community hub members to other neighborhoods, um, including the East Scarborough storefront and the Bathurst Finch Unison Hub. These are two hubs of many that have thriving community gardens and innovative rainwater collection systems to increase that food sustainability. Tonight, even at the Bathurst Finch Unison Hub, the community is launching a new food coalition, and one of their goals is to produce healthy local food year-round. They're going to need to uh, un overcome a lot of barriers in order to accomplish that kind of initiative. These communities and many more have already started our food system transformation. But now it's time for the city to take some new commitments to propel that change forward and reduce some of these barriers. And we agree with what the Food Policy Council has said, that food is a public good and that strong food policy can be used as a tool to increase our health and well-being of Torontonians and build equitable and sustainable communities. The medical officers of, of health's recommendations today continue public health down a path of good food policy recommendations. And many years ago, as uh, Councillor Layton mentioned, our organization was involved in promoting the adoption of local food procurement in our city. And as a city that's surrounded by incredibly productive land in the Greenbelt and in our own communities, it's important that we support local farmers and buy local fruits and veggies wherever possible. Procurement policies are a very powerful tool that cities can use to ensure that public spending contributes to the public good. So we strongly support the city in procuring food that is healthier, plant-based, and sustainable. And when doing so, we ask you to please consider procuring food that is locally produced and harvested, that comes from suppliers that are decent work employers, and minimizes single-use packaging. 
And when you're deciding who to consult in order to implement these policies and programs, remember that sustainable plant-rich, low-carbon food systems are going to need a lot of people power to make it happen. Remember the Food Policy Council and the staff here who have a wealth of knowledge. Remember to consult the community leaders in Toronto that are already producing good fresh food or helping residents access nutritious food. Remember to consult with Indigenous peoples and First Nations who have long history of managing our region's trans traditional food systems and they're actively pressing for food and land sovereignty. Remember to consult with all the farmers and landholders who want to protect these abundant food and natural ecosystems from overdevelopment and they need our help in regenerating the land so it can produce sustainable food again. And lastly, remember to consult with workers who are a major, major part of our food system. An incredible amount of labour goes into our food system and they need to be committed um, in transforming it with workers. And just according to the Migrant Worker Alliance for Change, 40,000 migrant agricultural workers come to Canada every year. And they are working in our farm fields, greenhouses and food production factories. They are a major part of our food system and they are in dangerous low wage jobs and our laws often exclude them from basic protections. As your own reports confirm, food insecurity is caused by poverty. Other aspects of climate resilience are also affected by income. So there needs to be a commitment to reduce poverty at every policy the city passes. This food system transformation needs to be embedded in Toronto's climate action work. And I just encourage you to make sure this food strategy is in the next three-year implementation plan for Transform TO. Just going to ask you to wrap up in a sentence. Absolutely. And lastly, just to, you know, if we're serious about the climate emergency in our city, we need to, uh, I implore you all as members to prepare to invest in the city staff and the city programs, as well as the community infrastructure uh, to make Just this food system to... happen. Great. Thank you, Heather. Uh, any questions for Heather? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we initially had uh, Dr. Fiona Udall again on. Did you, had you indicated that you don't need to speak again? Oh, okay. Um, you, can, you have up to five minutes, so we will not rush you. I will try not to take the well, um, So if I may take the opportunity, because I got a little bit excited last time, so I didn't get to all my points. Um, but first of all, I want to commend you on uh, putting that motion forward. I think it's very important. This is a challenging topic because it does touch so many jurisdictions. Um, and while our current food system does a lot of things well, we can do better, as we've heard throughout this morning. And although what needs to be done for planetary and human health is clear, as is the need for action, how to do it is much less clear. So uh, in my world of nutrition, we have this, this emerging field of implementation science, which is essentially a recognition that we know what to do, but we don't know how to do it. So. Um, well, it's, and following the Toronto Environmental Alliance on this uh, deputation, I'd like to again emphasize the need for intersectoral, interdisciplinary perspectives um, in order to understand the trade offs. So I've often heard policy described as um, figuring out what problem you can live with. Um, so the more people are looking at it and, and thinking about the consequences to their sectors, the better. So that's a challenge. You know much better the, the, how the city functions and where that could sit. Um, and I also want to just acknowledge the difficulty. I work in a public sector institution at this particular point in history. Um, and it's, very, it's a challenge to retain work and not lose ground when you're faced with budgetary um, constraints. But I'd really like to encourage you to think about how you can best utilize the resources that we have at the city level. You know that you've got allies in the Toronto Food Policy Council. You've got allies with uh, lots of people such as myself who uh, will mobilize not only our own resources but those of the students because young people want to know how to make things better. And I really do believe that food has a strong convening quality. It, has, it can mobilize communities. Um, and so we can use that to help solve some of our pressing issues. Thanks. Thank you. Um, you didn't even time me. <laughs> oh, I d there's something up with the clock. I had you were two and a half minutes. Okay. So, no. 
Um, are there any questions for you, Fiona? Dr. Mc Director McKelvey. Uh, hey, you're a doctor, too. You, yes, I am. No, I, I'm uh, not used to the doctor. No, no, I was referring to um, Jennifer McKelvey. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so you were talking about an inter intersectoral or yeah. um, interdisciplinary and that it's really, this is about changing behavior more than anything else. Um, and about changing systems. Changing systems, okay. Yeah. Um, and through those systems, how much emphasis is being placed on making it easy and, um, and, and accessible? And so, so the, the example I give is, you know, growing up, I lived on like many, many children on like Katie Wonder Bread, peanut butter and Kool-Aid. Um, and I think that's, it, a lot of it has to do with, you know, you know, my mother went back to college when we were young, like time, my father had long commutes. So like, what is, what is the, how do we move forward to make this easy? Because maybe if it was like easier for them, they could have adopted some of the th these things. So, so how much work and research is being done on that? And, and do we need to be doing more in that area? Um, so I, I was born in Scotland, so I grew up on a similar diet when my parents came here. Right? Very few vegetables and very well cooked. Um, it's, there's multiple forms of resources that you need. Um, and time is one of those resources. There's time poverty. There's financial poverty. But we've seen such a transformation in our food system so that the ultra-processed foods dominate. And so it makes absolute sense from if you're looking at the trade-offs of time and resources in order to buy some of those, that shelf-stable food that doesn't go bad on the shelf. So the change that we've seen globally with the rise of, um, now we have equal numbers of people who are overnourished as opposed to just undernourished, neither of which should really exist, but that our biology hasn't changed radically in the past 30 years, but our food system has. So some of those negative externalities are not being costed into the price of food. So while we have, so it, it's very complicated. So it takes us, that's why it takes the systems approach to think about what incentives can there be? So we've seen a rise in the, the number of those meal subscription services where you basically assemble food. Um, so there's lots of innovations that can, that can make it more accessible. Um, but with the, I mean, the last thing we want to do is put it on the backs of women, right? Um, who are working, et cetera. And so it's not an easy solution. That's why it needs more than just, you know, I've got a very particular nutrition focus, but uh, that's why I much prefer to sit around a table with people from culinary, from environment, from transportation, from how do we, you know, one of the innovations of the Toronto Food Strategy was to uh, look at how to get fresh food on the, on the subways. How do you make it easy? Uh, thank you. So it's making the healthy choice the easy choice, I guess, is the, what we're aiming for. Right. Uh, no, thank you for that. And I've never heard the term time poverty, which I, I absolutely love, because I, I think that it, is, yeah. there is financial, but, but time is, is There's real, human capital, there's concern. social capital. Yeah. My, my husband, is his family has been in Canada for multiple generations, and when I was trying to do canning, teaching myself out of books, and I couldn't figure out why stuff was rising to the top, and he's like, oh, you just flip it over. I'm like, how do you know that? I just know it. So when you've immigrated and your food ways have been disrupted, you don't necessarily know how to do things. So there's, yeah, anyway, there's, there's lots to be done. Thank you. Yeah, I know, right? Floats to the top. Why is everything floating to the top? Thank you. Are there any other questions for Fiona? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Um, we had Zartasha Zeneb from the Toronto Youth Food Policy Council. Uh, I understand that Zartasha had indicated she didn't need to speak, but I wanted to check again. They've left, okay. And then our, thank you. Our final speaker is Tony Colley. Is Tony here? Welcome, Tony. Come on up, you'll have five minutes. The clock is up to my right, your left. Thanks. So my name is Tony Colley, and I'm the founder of a mobile platform called Be One to Give. It's a food waste diversion program that allows food retailers across the GTA to immediately donate their surplus food to shelters around the city. 
We operate like the standard consumer-based food delivery platform. However, our services are exclusively B2B. I don't want to get into the research of uh, food waste and food security because a lot of it has been mentioned. All of my research stemmed from the VCMI and Second Harvest Report. What I'm trying to do is integrate my program into retailers across the City of Toronto. There are over 20,000 retailers in the GTA. If each of those retailers were a, had a meal at the end of the day, that would be 20,000 meals being diverted and redistributed to shelters and drop-in centers across the city. I have a little anecdote I'd like to share with you if you don't mind. I visited St. Lawrence Market earlier this summer, had a great conversation with the director there. He told me all about what they were trying to do in their plans to integrate food waste and reduce the levels of food waste within that market. Uh, he did go on to tell me that in order for my program to be, and I don't want to use the word accepted, but uh, in order for me to approach the city to integrate my program into their platform, they would have to do, an, uh, I guess, an external RFP where my program may not be the one chosen. However, he did give me permission to go and speak to the retailers directly and, and suggest that they uh, become part of our program, become one of our customers, and we can start diverting their waste from St. Lawrence Market. When I walked through St. Lawrence Market, every single retailer in there said that they didn't have food waste. And I went to probably, I want to say, 75% of the retailers there. They either, they, they, some of them, they do, you guys do, St. Lawrence Market deals with Second Harvest, and a lot of that food is rescued on Saturdays uh, and taken by Second Harvest. But from Tuesday through Friday, all of that food that they have every single day is disposed of. Our food waste issue here, we have a $49 billion food waste issue in this country, and, and Ontario is responsible responsible for a third of it. Integrating this, a platform like this in the city would not only put Toronto on the map for reducing food waste, but it, it will immediately reduce the amount of food waste that, we are, that are stemming from daily operations in uh, food retailers across the city of Toronto. So if there's anybody here that I could speak to, Councillor Ram Tong, I'm actually in your, in your district, but uh, the lady that was from the Toronto Food Strategy that was speaking earlier, I would like to have conversations with individuals that could possibly give me insight as to how I could, how I could integrate my program into city spaces. There's a cafe downstairs, there's St. Lawrence Market, there's other buildings. Um, our, our program targets food that uh, has a shelf life of one to two hours to one to two days. So Second Harvest, we're not competing with any other food rescue charity out there. We are a for-profit social enterprise, so we actually have drivers that will drive around the city exactly like Uber Eats, but we are redistributing food from retailers to shelters on a nightly basis. Um, I showed up today not expecting to speak, but I'm glad I actually took the, the time to, to come up and speak to you guys, because anybody that could give me guidance on to where I can go and how I can establish this program in the City of Toronto would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Tony? Director Wong Tam? Uh, yes, thank you very much uh, for, for coming to speak today and also to introduce this, this product that you have, this service. Um, j just, with, with, um, just to clarify, are you seeking to, uh, to sell a product to the City of Toronto to assist us with the food diversion and eliminate food waste? Yeah, we are a for-profit social enterprise, so we charge the retailers. We don't charge the City of Toronto. The retailers actually pay us between $10, $20, or $50 per pickup based upon the type of uh, establishment that they are. Uh, a smaller, like a, let's say a standard grocery store would be a $20 retailer where we would rescue all of their food. I've been doing research at all the grocery stores around the city. I took a picture at Metro Grocery Store here at Young and College about 5 to 10. They close at 10 o'clock at 5 to 10. I took a picture of all the food that they have left over in their hot food counters, and there was meals to probably serve about 50 to 100 people. Okay. And that food is simply disposed of. Okay, so, so just to clarify, there is, and that, that sounds like a fantastic service and a platform you've created, but, uh, but, the really, but really um, uh, you are looking to sell a service, um, not necessarily directly to the City of Toronto, although you did approach our, our um, St. Lawrence Market yes. director, um, and you, you weren't trying to sell the service to the City of Toronto, but you wanted access to the actual food producers and the food resellers and the food uh, 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 sort of um, manufacturers. Is that correct? Yes, well, both. I would sell the service to the City of Toronto. The process I was told is a little different. Um, there's, an, uh, I guess, a, an open call for anyone that could offer services to the City. Okay and that could remove me from this selection process. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I think that the reason why city staff gave you that response is because you're largely being treated as a vendor uh, looking to influence the city of, uh, of Toronto decisions. Not that your, your product isn't great or your service isn't very, very uh, needed, um, but there is, a, there is a process around lobbying 
uh, if there's a there's a declaration that will have to be done. Even this interaction right now will have to be registered. If you don't have your lobbyist registry number, you've got to get one. Okay. And then you need to now <laughs> register the fact that you've come before us to uh, to to. Um, to state your deputation, which is a form of lobbying. But I, okay. I think I just wanted to give you that information. I think that's important. Thank um, but thank you very much, to, nevertheless, for, for bringing to our attention this, this service that you have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions for Tony? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to, before the lunch break, so I'm going to bring this into committee, questions of staff. Uh, Director Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just really quickly, we have a local food procurement policy. Can, can anyone tell me how that's performing? Are we doing well? Uh, not great. Uh, it seems to be like we have written uh, into an honest, RFP that... Uh, there's, there's new work being done that's fabulous in our long-term care homes. Uh, in collaboration with Greenbelt, and that is really exciting and new. Um, but it's time to reinvigorate that work and bring the uh, planetary health, uh, you know, because it's more than local, it's mm -hmm. local and sustainable. But, you know, they, it's not dead, but it's not uh, thriving. Some other jurisdictions are doing quite well in this regard. Could you tell us a little bit about how they're performing and what they're doing. Well, um, we work through the Greater Golden Horseshoe Food and Farming Alliance that brings together uh, stakeholders, including public health, but cities uh, in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. And they are working also with Greenbelt on uh, developing excellent uh, local products. And this is particularly the focus in long-term care homes. Uh, in children's services, we are doing some good work, uh, but a lot of our uh, food served is uh, through third-party vendors, so it's not so much direct operations. Um, but it's time to, to really uh, work collaboratively right across the city. So, so right now, as the local food procurement policy works, we write into an RFP that we, we kind of like local food, but it's not one of the, yeah, it, it's, it's not a requirement. We have uh, been in discussion and have started some really good work with our colleagues in solid waste management on the circular economy for food work. And one way of uh, integrating uh, sustainable and local is potentially to get a designation through our social procurement policy, for example, but actually embedding it in the circular economy for food work could be uh, a really effective uh, vehicle. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Director McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is to, to Barbara. When we signed the C40 food declaration, did we also sign on to the Cool Food Pledge? And can you just say how those are interrelated? Um, the Cool Food Pledge is a small, essentially a small component of the Good Food Cities declaration. It is only uh, one piece of the procurement. Um, there are a number of cities across the world who have signed on to the Cool Food Pledge but haven't gone as far as signing the Good Food Cities Declaration. The Cool Food Pledge is very much in sync with the Declaration and why we are uh, very interested in it, as I indicated in my presentation, is that it will leverage the capacity for the GHG calculations from the World Resources Institute, which could be a very helpful deliverable for transform TO for the food component of that. But there's nothing in that that is uh, out of kilter or not part of it, and as I say, uh, there are cities that have signed on, and uh, private sector institutions. Uh, there is a uh, private sector summit uh, happening in mid-November, where uh, the people from the World Resources Institute are coming, and uh, they are hoping that a number of local private industry uh, people will sign on to the Cool Food Pledge. So it's happening in a variety of ways uh, and growing. 
So do we need to give direction then um, through the Board of Health that we are part, do we need to make it clear that we are part of that and we need to report back on those activities as well? Or is that happening anyway? Or does it help for us to solidify that direction here? It would be extremely helpful to get a formal uh, direction supporting the City of Toronto uh, s signing on to the Cool Food Pledge. Okay. One of the things that we've run into, because this is very new work, they have not established a very formal process for actually signing on. So unlike the uh, declaration from C40, which had a very formal process, the Cool Food Pledge, we just need, frankly, to signal that we're interested in partnering and endorsing this work, and they would uh, work with us. But I, I think it's much stronger to come from the Board of Health and even stronger to come from City Council. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And can I, we're just coming up on 12.30 in the break for lunch. Can I just do a check? How many other members of the board have questions on this item? Director Perks. Okay. So we'll, let's, what I'd suggest is we're going to conclude questions now with your set, Director Perks, and then we're going to break for lunch before returning where we'll begin with speakers on this item, uh, as we do have a number of items still remaining. Uh, over to you, Director Perks. Thank you. Um, Barbara, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the action research component of the work you've done to date. Um, I can use some examples. What we do is incubate uh, new initiatives but don't operate them. So in the deputation uh, from North York Harvest, for example, earlier, we incubated this food reach initiative in collaboration with a number of other partners. Um, and got it up and running as a uh, method of procuring good, healthy food at <clears throat> wholesale pricing. But what we, <clears throat> once it's incubated, we aren't in a position to actually operate the initiative. So it was like giving birth to Food Reach, and now it is being operated by North York Harvest. Another <clears throat> example. <coughs> excuse me, is the mobile good food market, where we incubated that through our mapping work and collaboration with food, food Share. And that, again, we gave birth to the mobile good food market, which is now being operated by Food Share. Um, our community, thank you, our community food works program Again, we were in uh, a much more hands-on operations with that. It is now being operated in the community through working women. Okay, and, and my understanding, and I, I admit I've been away from uh, thinking about some of this stuff, but my understanding is this sort of hands-on partnership-based action research approach is uh, considered uh, in academic literature to be a best practice in dealing with social determinants of health and how to design programs, projects that get at barriers that currently exist. Is that right? Well, I'm certainly uh, supportive of that and I, I'm a very, very strong believer. Um, I think at the city we have many conversations about uh, uh, operating across divisions and across programs and we come together in these, uh, you know, whether it's a committee for this or a committee for that, and we have fabulous conversations, and then everyone goes away and does things exactly how they always did it. Action research means people come together and try things out. And I can tell you uh, the community food works uh, example is an absolutely wonderful example of cross-divisional uh, leveraging of resources. So our uh, uh, colleagues from Toronto Employment and Social Services would provide uh, supports for, for that initiative. Um, our, uh, you know, it became across uh, within uh, different programs in 
public health where you come across and you say, this is what I can contribute, this is what I can contribute. And for me, that's best practice because you actually put what you can and you use it as a way to realize your individual goal, but coming together collectively. And for me, that's the power of food and that's the power of action research. Thank you. Thank you. So to members of the board, we've concluded questions on this item. We're going to break for lunch to return at 1.30. We still have a couple items left, uh, but when we return, we'll begin with speakers on this item. All right. Thank you very much.